he's got the bright eyes of a young boy, but like the physique of a zombie and the um, demeanor of um, a killer. And he just and he he's just like Enya Song. Uh, Willem Dafoe is the Enya Song of Hollywood. <laughs> rude to podcast with uh, stuff in your face and your mouth really you, got, <laughs> you had you gave I think me so. all of that i can't respond to any just... of that because all of those openings are gold and they're too obvious for me to go for yeah, because I... otherwise people will find it but... gauche and everybody knows that when you present me with an opening i've got to take it i'm talking about anuses <laughs> I that didn't I didn't, <laughs> didn't think of, I was just thinking about, I was thinking about when Tara Long would sometimes be like snacking on chips on the show and you'd never said anything to her about her face or mouth I don't think but uh yeah I just had a cough drop in there and just took it out when you called ah oh. because yeah that's all it's a uh, it's a good cough drop it's the kind you like I think now I don't know what to do with it it's all sticky and wet. Uh, stick it behind your ear like that one in Charlie and the Wonka Factory. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, Baruch Salt, I think, did that. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Violet Beauregard. Beauregard. Violet, yeah, Violet Beauregard. Violet Beauregard, chewing gum. Yeah, that's right. Thanks for having me on the show again this week, Jim. I'm oh, happy you, to be here. Yeah, you're welcome as, as our special guest that just has, <laughs> has never left. <laughs> I think I have been on every episode, uh, sometimes late, but every episode yep. of the show since it rebooted. Since the reboot. Jeez. Over a year ago now? Is that right? Over a year ago, yeah. and we're also very close to the 200th episode. And a lot of people have asked Ow. questions. They're saying, oh, have you got any plans for episode 200? Are you going to do anything special? Do you know what you're doing? The answer is no. There are literally no plans for a special 200th episode, but there will be probably the day before we record. That's the way I'm looking at it oh. right now. Um, I'll pull something out of my cavernous rectum before we reach episode 200. Don't you worry about that. We've had some people like make you know fun suggestions, like I'll oh, get Anthony Birch back on, or get you know. Um, we'll see what happens. We'll see what goes on. Yeah. I mean, we've already got something special on this episode. Because I don't know if we you do. I don't know if you recognise that other voice that I'm talking to, but we are joined by Joseph Coney. The famous Oh, is that right? Soldier and capturer of children. As you know, there's a big publicity drive about this guy. I mean he's he's a, a, an international craze. The papers are raving about him. Um, so what's it like, mm. Joseph Coney, to just become an internet, to, to be the next Chocolate Rain? Or <laughs> leave Britney alone, the latest internet sensation that everybody's chatting about? Are you asking me? That's the joke. <laughs> you may notice it's exactly the same joke as the Chris Brown one and the Whitney Houston one. Um, uh, yeah, you did ask me yeah. how I was doing. As and the Muhammad, I claimed you were Muhammad once as well. Um, these are all hilarious racial goofs that <laughs> that I like to tell. Not racist, racial. There's a big difference. No. One, one is racist, and the other. Mm -hmm. Is stuff I say. <laughs> Which is just racial in in tone and topic. Yeah, it you, concerns, you don't mean anything by it. Yeah, no. it's just the fact that you you know you you look a bit like milky tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes uh, the weather's getting a little warmer, so I'll probably end up looking like a old dried up Hershey bar pretty soon that's kind of 
passion. <laughs> Icky, you know, milk chocolate, not dark chocolate. Mm-hmm. Uh, that'll that's something I can look forward to. Um, if I manage to get any sun, of course, I might need to get a tan for PAX East, which is coming up pretty soon because we might try to do a live action version of that masked wrestler level from Rhythm Heaven Fever. I don't know if you know that level, Jim. You might have seen it around, it's been remade. With Gabe Newell and with My Little Pony and with Scorpion from Mortal Kombat and uh, the Old Spice guy who played Camacho in that movie you don't like, uh, Idiocracy. Are, are you familiar with the level, Jim? The the mm. masked wrestler level? No. <laughs> it's gamer culture. It's quite, quite the crazy. Shit. I don't. I don't. Oh, come I don't on, like it's... what gamers like. Oh, come, but you are a gamer, Jim. No. You're, you're one of the gamers. So you are perhaps a, an archetypical gamer that was all in the, the trick. mind of many. Really? It was all a gag. I've never played a video game in my life. I don't even know what Rhythm Heaven is. <laughs> you know, yeah. So it, it, you could try to get away with that. Because I don't think you've been seen playing video games very long. You don't do the uh, the live streams of playing the Street Fighter Cross Tekken and the... Far Cry 2 and stuff like that. You just play them at events and then you claim to have played them when you write those reviews, but no one really knows. No one knows. Um, I mean, apart from people on Reddit, of course, who have the proof that I read the back of the box and then score according to whatever Activision gave me to do it. So, eh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I Half the time I don't even know what a video game is. I'll write the review. I've never even heard of it. I don't know. Like, I reviewed Silent Hill Downpour this Sunday. I don't even know what Silent Hill is. I thought it was originally a movie. I saw the movie, and I thought that was it. I thought this video game was a spin-off of that, of the film. Right, right. Like, otherwise, like, like you know, exactly like, like the Resident Evil movies. I thought, I thought Silent Hill was a rip-off of those original Resident Evil movies that they released uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, those came out two years ago. All those, all those movies. Uh, that Silent Hill downpour review. That's a thing you did. That is a thing I did. Thank you. Yeah, I was sad because for the first few seconds it didn't have a score, and I actually knew how it felt to be one of those score guys, being like, I want to know what the score <laughs> is. I started to like get all feverish about it because because uh, I was excited for for whatever reason. You could say you I got really... rhythm heaven feverish about it. Video game jokes, lol. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, yeah, I felt the heat. I wanted to see if this game stood up to the other games in the series, which have been pretty hit or miss, and they've all been by a uh, Western studio, right? Is this one also by a Western studio, Downpour? I didn't check. Yeah, yes. I think they are somewhere in Europe, they're based. Um, and they um, they didn't fail this time. They, is the, is these the guys... Even in interviews, you could tell these guys like were fans of Silent Hill, and especially mm-hmm. Silent Hill Two. Um, okay. And it seems that showed like they knew, because the other ones I don't think recent games really displayed much respect for the series, much knowledge that the people making it kind of, like understood uh, why people liked Silent Hill to begin with. But these guys clearly mm-hmm. already were fans, and I think that showed. I think that. That came through, and you've got a very genuine Silent Hill experience that, you know, does a few different things, and not all of them successful. The game is, it's got its faults. Um, I don't like the sequences where they force combat into it, Um, but those moments aren't the default experience. So yeah, I I was really impressed with Downpour, and I say this as someone who previewed it at E3 and tore it to fucking shreds. Um, and yeah, I, I quite a bit really of didn't like it at that point. Yeah, because mm-hmm, I mean, it's mm-hmm. considered gauche to be that negative in a preview. Um, really? Even even to readers, they it's like, oh, it's a preview. You should always have some sort of optimism for it. I don't know. But I played it at E3. I thought it was a piece of shit, um, mostly because in some bizarre twist, um, which seems to be indicative of Konami's cluelessness lately, they. The, the E3 demo was a combat demo. They had one little chase sequence, and the other part of it was just combat with these enemies that kept respawning. The actual section that was in the E3 demo is different 
in the main game, in the full game. It's not just this arena with monsters that keep spawning after you. Uh, and, and, and obviously it's, it's much better for that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was... Yeah, it was much better than I had originally seen because, like I said, I dumped on it after E3 and I was expecting, you know, not hoping, but expecting to dislike this one a lot. And I really, really enjoyed it. And by the time it was finished, I was like, yeah, I just played a pretty fucking good Silent Hill game. Um, I don't think everyone's going to agree. IGN certainly didn't. They gave it, um, I think, a 4.5. Really? Uh, yeah, oh. it's been mixed, you know, it's gone anywhere from that 4.5 all the way up to my 8. I think the highest score it's gotten is a 9 from Rely on Horror. Uh, otherwise, you're looking at 8, 7s, I think 1 or 2, 6s. It, it is quite a bit across the board, so... Huh, interesting. I think it depends yeah. on what you look for. Sure, sure. And, and IGN, in my ex- experience, does not always have the most kind of flexible standards they they tend to kind of check off box their reviews not always of course but more so than other sites like um you know the is are the controls easy and did i kill a bunch of guys yes then good game if no bad game and what controls uh what good controls mean is totally subjective but um but they tend to take a more objective stance that's why they didn't like god hand that's why they didn't like deadly premonition they didn't kind of flex on their standards and take a game for what it is and uh, instead they were kind of looking for it to fit a certain mold and if it didn't fit that fold they fit yeah. that mold they, they think, dumped on it I think they review them as as products right exactly uh, and I have always tried and I you know I was trying to encourage destructoids other reviewers to review them as it is as experiences, and I, I wince as I say that word because I did call out a lot of reviewers last week for overusing the word experience. But I do try and review them as an overall piece of entertainment, and my biggest question is, was I entertained? Not, you know, mm-hmm. do the graphics meet a, a certain standard? Do the controls meet a certain standard? Um, it's more... Do the graphics actively take away from the fun I'm having? Do the controls get in the way of my enjoyment? And mm-hmm. and that's how I can be, you know, I, I, I'll I tend to be a bit more forgiving of those things if they don't. You know, if the controls are old-fashioned and maybe a bit annoying, but I'm still having a, a great time, it's not going to hold as much weight as I think it would in IGN sort of review style, where they, like you say, it's they're very technical about it. It's like... We've got to review the graphics. Are they good? Yes, no, and then they'll give give it all separate scores. You know, which is mm-hmm. strange to me, but you know that's their their bag, and I don't tend to agree with a lot of IGN's reviews. Um, all the way, some of them are written. They come across as school projecty sometimes. <laughs> um, Ouch! Yeah, but, they're a pretty big site to come across that way. Mm. Yeah, well, there's, there's certain mm. like styles and tones over there that it, it just doesn't strike me as the kind of writing I like to read. Um, which you know, it's fine. Ah, you're Ob- being really polite. Obviously, That's they're super <laughs> polite. Of you. That was well, like a, a me statement. Well, it's we, not bad writing. It's just not the reading I want to write. I think I'm it's sorry, time we reversed out. our roles. Cause you, oh, let's do it. You piss people off a lot more <laughs> the way you do stuff than the way I do stuff, as I'm sure we'll get to later. Um, sure. Just to put a cap on the IGN stuff, it's like obviously I'm in the, I clearly in a minority because so many people do read IGN, and that's cool. You know, that's their bag. And there are some people at IGN that I like. Um, it's there are a few people who I think write in a remedial fashion, but there are other writers on there that I. You know, I like they they really good personalities. Um, but as far as their reviews go, it, it is a, a style that I don't really agree with. And and that leads to, you know, obviously them giving Deadly Premonition a 2 and me giving Deadly Premonition a 10. Uh, which for a while were the only two reviews on Metacritic. Which I... It was my wall, uh, desktop <laughs> wallpaper for a while was just their review under mine. Just 10 and 2. Yeah, yeah. Uh, those were the days. And God Hand. I don't know if you even like God Hand, but... They gave that, I think, uh, a 4.5. Of course, I've gotten over it now, and I've learned to be more accepting, but I was uh, much younger and much more fueled by feelings back then, and boy, was I upset. How could they People do that to God are. hand? Co- People still are. P- people, 
even when fueled by feelings. Well, I mean, about God Hand. Even I was reading some oh, yeah. of the forum threads about Downpour and some of the reviews it was getting. And I think in not just game trailers, but also NeoGAF. Um, I could be wrong about NeoGAF. It might have been another forum. But when IGN's review was brought up for Downpour, straight away someone comes up, well, these are the guys that gave God Hand a four, so fuck them. Um, <laughs> a lot of people have not... Which is kind of rotten. I mean, it's not the same reviewer or anything. That's a, I, I always get a little sad when people say, well, Destructoid gave such and such a score, so they should also give this game the same score, or, oh, don't trust that score because they gave such and such game score. Well, it's totally different reviewers. It's under the, the blanket, the warm and cuddly blanket of Jim Sterling's supervision. Of how our reviews are done, but still, it's, it's different people, right? Yeah, and even, right if, it's, even if it's right. the same reviewer, you know, different games mm-hmm. are going to get different scores for different reasons. Um, mm-hmm. I'm Just today, I was still fending off um, arguments from people bringing up Modern Warfare 3 again. Like, it fucking... Like, <laughs> really? anyone died because of that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there was a guy on Twitter who, you know, felt the need to rope me into an app reply. Because obviously I need to know. Um, mm. And he tweeted something like, oh, well, Jim Sterling stands by his Modern Warfare 3 review, but he gave Mario Kart 7 a 5. And people wonder why I don't read Destructoid anymore. <laughs> Which was like red rag to a bull. I had to retweet him and say, who the fuck's been asking him why he's not reading Destructoid? <laughs> I can't fathom anybody caring. Um, and his little sort of snotty attempt backfired on him because he spent pretty much all day fending off replies from my followers, just sending him things like, hey, I've heard on the grapevine that you don't read Destructoid anymore. Why? I'm having a hernia with shock that you don't read Detroit anymore. Um, the arrogance of some people on the internet continues to astound me. This idea that I need to personally know that they are not reading Destructoid, and that I should still cater myself to their tastes, even though they're not my readers, by their own admission. Um, right. That level of, of, of ego. And this is me saying this, criticizing <laughs> ego, is astounding to me, that they would be so you know, self-important that I need to know. Well, that reminded me, uh, you're reminding me right now of that funny email we got today in the tips line. Do you remember that funny email? Oh, that was amazing. The, are you thinking what I'm thinking? The uh, the Mass Effect one. Yeah, that was so funny. Mm. <laughs> I'm so happy about it. Some uh, of the lines of, uh, oh, if you've got it up, yeah, by all means read it out. Oh, yeah, I can just find it. Um, I don't have it up. I was going to reenact it, though, in my mind. He said something like, so, your website sucks, and I hate what you write. Hey, why don't you write about this? This might make your website less terrible. You terrible website, guys. He was doing what the fighting game community were doing uh, a couple of weeks back, where it was all that, oh, "Oh, I I hate what you wrote about this community, you wanker. Um, (laughs) We are nice people, here's the proof. And basically insinuating, you know, I demand that you post this proof that it's not 100% terrible all of the time. And uh, being terrible to us in the process of telling us that he's not terrible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I have that email it's anymore. Right. Political correctness, where it's like if you talk about one bad aspect of a community, you instantly have to balance it out by posting something positive, even if that's not interesting to you or your readers. Um, it's not my job to portray anyone in a good or a negative light. My job is to just post stuff that interests me. People bitching about Mass Effect 3's ending and demanding it be rewritten because it wasn't happy enough for them. Um, Like fucking what's-her-face Kathy Bates in Misery. (laughs) Oh, yeah, you did that post about it. Yeah, it is similar to that. It's not my job to make those people look better. Right. Yes, it's uh, especially with a. It was something about Mass Effect Three fans doing something for charity. It was, it was nice, but it, it was to- totally unrelated to the fact that those same fans may have a kind of strange, almost unhealthy connection to the series and an entitlement that comes along with that uh, connection that's causing them to think that they're de- owed a certain narrative conclusion to. 
the the game series that they like. It, it's it's weird. It's it's weirded me out for a long time, and I see it a lot with people who love fantasy games or fantasy in general, mm. sci-fi being a kind of fantasy, where they fall in love with the world. And then once they fall in love with the world, they start to craft an idea of what the story of that world should be. And if the people who actually created that world create a story that differs from the story that they've already kind of uh, created in their own minds, they get really, like, it's almost like a, what they call in um, psychological terms when you have object inconsistency. Do you know about object inconsistency, Jim Sterling? Is this interesting? No, I, I do tell not you about know it? about it. By all means. Okay. Well, um, when, a, when a baby is just growing up, figuring out how the world works, one of the things that the baby brain doesn't know how to do yet is have real object, incons- uh, object consistency. So that's why peekaboo works. If you cover a baby's face uh, and it can't see you, it, re- it literally thinks you've like teleported to another world or something. And then when you take your hands away in your back, it's like, whoa, how'd you do that? You just existed again. <laughs> when you were, when I couldn't see you, you were gone. And then when you, when I could see you, you exist. And, uh, it's all the formation of the, 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 the human mind's ability to have an idea of what's real and what's not. And when you have a fantasy world, these guys want this world to be real and they start to invent in their mind what really is happening in it and what should happen. And when the writers go off of their script, uh, it makes the world feel less real to them and it also makes them upset to see the story not turn out the way they thought it should. So combine all the things together, you get this kind of irrational, like real venomous anger at the people who created the object inconsistency and also like a heartfelt desire for their idea of the reality to be real, which is why you have these like diehard fans uh, clamoring for the ending they think should exist and that they think does exist because it exists in their own mind. They want that ending to, to be made by Bioware and they honestly think that it will be if they yell for it enough. It's really weird stuff, isn't it? Mm. It's fascinating to see. I mean, I tried to stay kind of on the fence about that issue, mostly because Mass Effect 3's story, well, Mass Effect story, isn't something I'm particularly invested in, so I, you know, I don't want to get too deep into it. Um, But another thing that comes up is this idea that I notice this especially with American audiences, and I think it's something Hollywood's helped to cultivate, is this idea that everything must have a happy ending, and a definitive Uh, happy ending, you know, a happily ever after ending. There are a lot of people that didn't like that the, and you know, we're going into spoiler territory, I'm so sick of that fucking word, but be warned um, if, you know, you're interested in Mass Effect 3 and you haven't beaten it yet, you know, I'm gonna talk about vaguely talk about the endings. Um... Basically, you got a couple of potential endings for Mass Effect 3. Uh, none of them are particularly happy. Um, you've got some very bleak um, prospects at the ending, and a lot of people felt that because it was so bleak and there was a lot of loss involved, all their hard work over the course of the past three games were literally for nothing. And that huh. totally, you know... it. It ignores that whole question of, you know, is the destination the point of the journey or is the journey itself Mm. worthwhile enough? And you'd think that if you've already gotten that much joy out of three video games, that it wouldn't be pointless because the ending was, was some sort of tragedy. You know, you still had the journey. You enjoyed the journey for, I mean, hundreds of hours. Sure. If not more. Uh, so I don't quite get this idea that... And, and I say this possibly because, you know, I'm British and culturally we do like a tragic ending. We like misery. Um, that's Even our comedy is usually based in the squalid and the ugly. Um, and I'm a big fan of bleakness as a, as a narrative concept. So to me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not bothered by the idea of this tragic ending. And, and I'm always reminded, especially when I see these people demanding a retcon and a rewrite to something a bit more hopeful for them, uh, I'm always reminded of Little Shop of Horrors, the really the, the musical uh, about the talking plant, the the, the singing plant. Um, sure, happens to be one of my favourite plays of all time, and the movie version. You know, I love the movie version. Um, the big difference between the movie version of Little Shop of Horrors, I'm talking about the musical one, not the black and white uh, one. Sure, the Jack Nicholson one. Yeah, the Jack Nicholson one. Um, 
the big difference between the musical stage play of Little Shop and the movie is the ending. Now, in the musical play at, at theatres, and you'll see this today, uh, Audrito, the, the, the killer plant, takes over the world. Um, Seymour dies. Audrey dies. Uh, spoiler warning, by the way, <laughs> for this ancient story. Um, this corporation comes in, takes cuttings of Audrey Two, and which was the plant's original plan, and all those plants grow up into Audrey Twos and take over the planet Earth. That sounds great. That happens in a play. That happens in the play version. In the oh, movie, how the hell version, do they pull that off, special effects wise? It's usually of... they 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 just show the uh, company coming in and taking cuttings, and then there's a song about Audrey 2 taking over the world. And I think in some productions you'll have vines like coming in through the theatre and stuff to imply that, oh my god, the plant's sort of taking over the whole theatre. Um, very cool. Fun. Very dark yeah. ending uh, for mm -hmm. what is sort of a, a, a black comedy. And in the movie, um, if you've seen it, Seymour electrifies. It's You can tell it's such a rush job ending. You know, the plant supposedly wins, um, attacks Audrey, um, supposedly she dies, uh, brings the shop down over Seymour, and then Seymour, just out of nowhere, just bursts out of the rubble, picks up an electric part, um, lead, electrocutes the plant, and it blows up. And that's it. Electrocutes a plant? He electrocutes a plant because of reasons. Um... <laughs> Does that even work? I've never tried it, so well, I can't exactly. speak it's, to it. But. It's a rushed ending, and that's because they'd already filmed the original ending, the downer ending, uh. where Audrey 2 takes over the world, and Audrey and Seymour die. Whoa, can you get that ending in the movie? Is there, like, a deleted scene? I think outpost? there is. There's only, like, very bad test footage now. But uh, here's the thing. Here's where this long, pointlessly roundabout discussion takes us. Um, yes. The original ending was tested with a Hollywood test audience, and they hated it. Oh, of course. Because they demanded a happy ending. And that, this has always stuck with me as, as not just a fan of Little Shop, but as just someone who enjoys um, tragedy. It has always been a very, a point of anger for me that audiences in that test audience, this Hollywood sort of audience, were that delicate that they couldn't handle uh, an unhappy ending in what was already a very macabre comedy. And, sure. and that's what I'm reminded of here. It's like, for, so, for some, clearly the journey is rendered pointless because mm. they didn't have a happy ever after ending, or at least a, a hopeful ending that means they, you know, they can keep living on their fantasy worlds um, beyond the game. And I find that a shame. I find that... I find it distressing that tragedy has no place in the mind of many audience members across a wide range of media. Uh, and, and that's sad, because tragedy can often be used with comedy um, to make something more uh, meaningful, more poignant. And again, I say this as someone who isn't that invested in Mass Effect 3 story, but I, I kind of respect that Bioware did that, that they felt that a more down... You know, a more more of a downer ending, a bleak ending, was the perfect way to cap off the journey and make it all more poignant. Um, but for some people, they just don't see that. They don't see it as making everything that happened more meaningful. They see it as rendering it completely pointless. And I just, yeah. I think that's a shame. And I think that there is room for these, you know, sadder endings. Um, but people don't like it. And it's the same reason they don't like cliffhanger endings. They always find cliffhangers bullshit because everything's got to have a definitive good ending. And I find that almost cowardly in a way, you know? I find it people that are afraid to accept that, you know, shit happens. And they just want this, you know, everything in media to reinforce their idea that good people get what's coming to them, bad people get punished, and everything is right and just in the world. Is my mic working? Yep. Oh, good. I thought it wasn't working. I was like, hey, boop, that. Uh, but uh, I don't know if you heard me. <laughs> Sorry, I was chiming I, in. I was going to, oh, that's okay. You're on its tear. I love it. I was going to talk about uh, Armageddon starring um, Bruce Willis as a great uh, example of tragedy and comedy coming together to really pack a punch, pack a dramatic punch. Yeah? Yeah. 
<laughs> no, it didn't. Do it! <laughs> I'm, I'm lying. I'm lying. Armageddon starring Bruce Willis. It was unintentionally funny. And then he died at the end. And people accept it in movies like that. For whatever reason, people accept it when the old guy who's not that cute... Maybe that's what they should have done. They should have had a an old guy die at the end of Mass Effect 3. Because I think... In some of the endings, they all die, right? Or it's alluded to the fact they all die? I think so. I think there are some endings where it's just like everything's fucked. And I think even in the yeah. best case scenario, a heavy cost is, is paid and the universe is basically shattered to bits, I think. Right. But maybe they survived. I think they leave one ending open. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they might survive. For the other complaints I've heard about the ending is that it's too short and that it's got too many plot holes and they just it felt weird to them. And I think there's a lot going on with this controversy around the uh, the ending of the game. Some of it has to do with the fact that, as we've talked about on prior episodes, uh, the third entry of any series that's on the same console is just always pisses people off for some reason. It always disappoints people. Um, sometimes it's a mild disappointment. Like, you were mildly disappointed with Gears of War 3, and sometimes it's like a vehement hate people have for it. People didn't like Uncharted 3 either, but I still hear people complaining about that all the time. Even though it's essentially, uh, you know, more of what people liked, but you can't help but have a higher standard for it. And uh, people, like I was saying before, had had a preconceived notion of what should happen, and their people always get mad. They don't get their notions made, you know? Why do people love those notions, Jim? They've got notions about you and me and Mass Effect and life and video game blogs and reviews and notions. All these notions. I think they're part of the problem. I think they are the problem. They're the whole problem with everything. We need to get rid of notions, Jim. How do we do it? People need to stop thinking. Yeah? The think. That's where the trouble is. We need to... (laughs) We need to stop with thinking. <laughs> well, they, I've been meaning to write a, an article on this for a long time. People think they know why they like something or don't like something. And uh, that is usually wrong. They usually don't know why they like or, likes, uh, or don't like something. And um, that wrongheaded perspective on themselves leads them to get really kind of indignant and angry a lot of the time. And demanding that things are always done just the way they like it. And if they got what they wanted, if uh, they wrote the picture-perfect ending for Mass Effect and everything was happy and great, that might have left them even more dissatisfied in the long run because it would have been cliché. And that's one thing the series has really fought to do is to not be cliché. Yeah. Cliché, but yeah. It, it's better than most. Yeah, it's better than a lot of games. I don't know. I, d- I don't know how something, how a game that people bought and continued to play for hours mm-hmm. without being forced to, you know, they weren't having to review it. They could stop at any time. I don't know how someone could play something for that long and be that upset and just could keep exposing themselves to it and then turn it into what has basically been a crusade of theirs for the past couple of weeks. I, yeah. I can't understand that, that level of, of, distress and, and upset over something they claim to love. I, you know, I'm, I, I'm a big fan of Silent Hill. I can get rather protective of it. But if, you know, once the series started, it started pissing me off, you know, I, I didn't like Homecoming at all. Um, wasn't a big fan of Shattered Memories. I stopped. I just stopped, mm. wrote it off. And obviously Downpour sort of has brought me back into the fold and, and really impressed me, and I'm happy about that. But I didn't spend my entire life whining about the ones I didn't like. It was like, well, that's shit. Konami has <laughs> gone mental. Uh, best move on. You know. Um, yeah. Because at yeah, the end well, of the day, you... you can't control this stuff. No. You, can't contr- you can't tell. You can't control a universe being controlled by someone else. Uh, so it pays not to get to too upset over it and too emotionally invested in it. Um, You know, it was the same with fucking Aliens. You know, I'm not a big fan of Aliens, I am. And, you know, Aliens vs. Predator, Aliens vs. Predator 2, they pissed all over everything. They fucking ruined everything. (laughs) But it doesn't pay to get, like, that protective and upset and, and stop yourself from enjoying the rest of it. 
Oh, know, sure. I'll still sure, watch yeah. Aliens and, and Alien Resurrection, one of the best films ever made, and be totally happy with that and, and just put the other ones that I didn't like from my mind. You know, we've got that power as consumers. We can choose what to pick up and what to put down. Yeah, yeah. I think that it, you're doing yourself a disservice if you let a five-minute ending just erase all the fun that you had had for three games prior to that, which some people are saying that the ending in Mass Effect 3 did. Uh, I hope they don't really mean that because that would be a shame. It's like if, you know, you have a great relationship with a human being and then, you know, they have a penis, it turns out. You don't uh, and maybe that's maybe you like penis, but uh, maybe you don't. But for me, I wouldn't let finding out my girlfriend has a penis uh, ruin all the great dates that we had before that. And uh, you know, I might be able to work, work around the penis. Why don't they just work around the ending? Exactly, work around Mass Effect Three's penis. Yeah, just find a hole that works for you and uh, <laughs> and make love to it. Exactly. That's a that's for a, you a, as well. Put that on a t-shirt. Do it for you. Like, it doesn't matter to us yeah. at the end of the day. Because some people seem to think it matters to us um, how upset and, and how just their, their reasonings are. Um, mm. It's for your benefit to drop the right. grudge and, and enjoy the actual fun you've had with Mass Effect rather than yeah. let everything you've enjoyed be tainted. Uh, the ending doesn't invalidate the fun you've had with Mass Effect. You invalidate the fun you've had with Mass Effect by deciding that's what the ending did. Um, wow. Ultimately, it doesn't yeah. take away the enjoy, the genuine joy that that series has given you. And I'm not saying, obviously, you know, be in love with Bioware still. You can still be disappointed, but don't, don't be disappointed to such a degree, such an ex extreme degree, that you feel you can no longer ever enjoy Mass Effect again as an entity. Yeah, that's right. Good advice, Jim. I think we should make some sort of... Maybe this would be in bad taste, because the Coney video that you talked about earlier, Joseph Coney, um, it really seems to be working. It seems that if you make a video like that, you can get people to get mad about somebody or something and talk about it a lot. Does that work? Making a video like that? Um... Should we make a Coney video? <laughs> Let's make a Coney video about okay. something. Yeah, I wonder what. We can get a little kid to talk about it. Um, hmm. hmm. I'm thinking about a good subject. Yeah, something that we want. We don't even have to hate it, but we just want everyone else to hate something for a little bit. Or we could go the other uh, way. We could yeah. we could foster love for somebody that we think oh, I don't deserves, think... like Yafet Koto. The who's that? He was the the big black actor from Alien and Freddy's Dead: The Final Nightmare. <laughs> we could do a video on no Rutger Hauer. We could do a video right on Rutger Hauer to give him his own TV series called uh, The Rut and Friends. Where every week him and another old celebrity from the 80s um, travel around the United States of America. Oh, this is fucking good. In a, in a caravan built to look like a tank. Which they Why? use... Which, it's, it's not a tank, it just is built to look it's like It's built one. to look like a tank, which they use to wage war on prejudice. <laughs> Rutger Hauer? Yeah, Rutger Hauer is like <laughs> he'll drive this caravan tank, right? The car he'll call it a, a carav bank. The caravan tank. Or the caravan, right? And he'll be like, "I'm Rutger Hauer, and this is the caravan, <laughs> and I'm here in Florida <laughs> because <laughs> because this." Um, shrimp restaurant isn't hiring enough black people. In this, in this giant fake tank. Yep. <laughs> it just puzzles everyone, distracts and puzzles everyone. Like, why do you have a tank? Shut up. Yep. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. It's like, <laughs> he basically just parks it in front of the shrimp restaurant so that uh -huh. the people eating, and it's alfresco, people are eating outside. But 
they come for the sun and the and the, the view, the view of the lovely Miami Beach. But they can't sure. because some idiot has parked a caravan shaped like a tank in front of their beautiful view, and the shade is making their shrimp fondue cold. Ah, for, it's for a, and, and it's all in order to, to fight racism. And it's all in order to fight racism. Um, <laughs> it is important to note that Rutger Hauer literally just received an email from someone <laughs> saying that the shrimp restaurant didn't hire any black people. Uh, the fact that it has three black waiters is ignored by Rutger Hauer. And also the fact well, sure. that the email came from the restaurant owner's ex-wife, who was bitter and annoyed at him, um, also doesn't factor into the story. Right. Um, well, he's, and in he's the end, bigger things to yeah, do. Yeah. At the mm. end, to be honest, yeah. Rutger Howard does a lot more harm than good. He has... <laughs> he has slandered a good man on television. He has annoyed... 50 patrons of El Shrimpo. El Shrimpo of Miami. <laughs> He's littered because, to be honest, he spent all day drinking <laughs> drinking cans of Sprite while leaning against the caravan and just dropping the cans on the floor. He's a messy man, Rutger. And his celebrity for that week was... Um, Jesse Ventura, who, <laughs> who was oh, no. really annoying. He, he's noisy. He's a noisy man, and he just kept kicking a metal trash can that was outside. Just kicking it, shouting, racist, racist, racist scum. I was, he would I, do that. Too. Yeah, he's, listen he's to like me. I was dog. the governor of Nebraska. I know what I'm doing. Was it Nebraska? It was in this television oh. show. <laughs> Of course, sure. It's an element the of rut drama. In him, <laughs> him not telling the truth about who he was the governor of. And I think it was actually California. Um, that's oh, an no. element of no. drama and tension in the show. Because you need, oh, yeah. you need the human element. And a, a lot of people identify with being untruthful about which state you were the governor of. Just a lying ex-actor, ex-governor, ex-wrestler. Yeah. People so, relate with that. So, yeah, I mean, Rutger was littering. Um, Jesse was doing not only noise pollution, but lies. Uh, the tank, a bit of it broke off, fell in the sea. It was painted with toxic paint. A fucking seagull bit down on that and died. <laughs> One seagull died. So... <laughs> It's funny, the tally of the... Not bad, not really bad. Just mildly annoying. Just they, they mildly go out on a crusade. damaging, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm picturing the theme song and the uh, the opening uh, with a monologue by Rutger Hauer, like, this big country of ours needs some help. And me and Jesse Ventura are the only men that can <laughs> do it. Just driving, like, 35 miles per hour on the highway in a big tank. People... <laughs> People passing them, but they're really sincere and and uh, oh, they and genuinely want sure to help. That they're going to help. Yeah, they're just yeah, yeah, they really mean ignorant it. of what they're doing wrong. You know, you've got constantly just. I mean, even in the caravan, you can't move for empty cans of spray. I mean, the guy he fucking drinks, <laughs> he drinks them like a fish, albeit a fish that could live in carbonated lemon lime drink. Right, so there's like 800 cans of spray like, just bouncing looks, around. Yeah, it's like an episode of Hoarders in there. <laughs> but it's only cans of spray. <laughs> yeah, and it makes Jesse angry, because every time he turns a corner, you just hear this almighty rattle as this tidal wave of aluminium just careens across the floor and hits the interior of the caravan. And Rutger, he laughs every time. He thinks it's fun. He, oh, thinks, sure, yeah. he thinks it's a wacky element of the show, and he doesn't realise it's getting to Jesse, who's just trying to drive to a destination and fight some honest-to-God racism and or uh, trans... I was going to say transgenderism, but that's an actual <laughs> thing, uh, yeah, which we yeah, don't want to uh, fight. It's whatever the dislike of transgenderism is. Uh, yeah, it's an ism. Transgenderismism. Yeah, it's this istic. Yeah. It's gen transgenderisticisms, I think. Yeah, that's what it is. And that was, you know, 
And then that's an episode where they go to uh, New York. Oh, right. Because someone fired their employee for having a sex change. Oh, dear. Oh. That's not good. No. So, for two weeks, Rugger Hell, Jesse the Body Ventura, in cocktail dresses, <laughs> parading up and down. <laughs> Many called it offensive. They didn't realise they were there to help. Uh, many right. thought they were just making fun of transgender people. Um, because, I mean, they were holding signs that said things like, Ooh, ooh uh, I'm gay. Uh, and they didn't realise that they were just, like, pointing at themselves and saying, If I was gay, that wouldn't undo all of the excellent work I've done in Hobo with a Shotgun and The Hitcher. And he was in The Hitcher, too? Oh, it's your oh. wedlock. You know, it doesn't undo the fact that I was in the Sandy and Merlin for a bit. <laughs> he was in uh, Blind Fury yeah. as well, a movie that I think about a lot. Yeah. So it doesn't movie. matter if I was gay; it wouldn't undo what all the good all the good I've done in Blind Fury. <laughs> Get over it! I'm holding a sign that says "Ooh, uh, I'm gay and I like to kiss men." And in brackets, Ooh, uh. in brackets, he wrote "dirty, dirty boy," <laughs> which again, <laughs> he, they didn't realise that the brackets was him attacking society, saying "dirty boy." They thought the whole sign was him in a cocktail dress, implying all gay people, you know, wear women's clothing and that they are dirty boys. Which was that just right. fired in his face. He was like, "I'm here to help you," and then, you know, Jesse Ventura ever the man to put his foot in it, he just he said, well, fuck it this is fucking gay and he didn't <laughs> mean it offensively but people were upset and that's, that's, that's my pitch for a new weekly show called More Harm Than Good with Rudd Hammer. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a, a phenomenally successful show uh, I mean, that people f- would be what were we talking about? Um, I don't. Oh wow, I don't know. Uh, something about. Wow, I have no idea how we got on that, but you really just spontaneously created that. That wasn't that pilot. entertaining. None of that was. That was inaccessible at best. What, what your pitch for said. an idea show? Everything really was said. I didn't find a word. I don't know. Funny. I th- I thought it was quite thought provoking and um and uh. What do you call it? Inspired. It seemed like an inspired idea because we've all been that Rudker Hauer in our lives, right? Thinking we're doing the right thing. We can all relate with a kind of leathery faced, jowly uh, 69 year old action movie star who wants to go on the road and, and, and save the world. It only makes it worse in the progress. I mean, the process. We've all done that, right? Yeah, I think it says a lot about life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. And racism. I'm always up for talking more about uh, about racism. I, I was thinking about writing a feature about why I think that uh, people keep saying that Japanese games are, are bad now, when I don't think they actually are bad, Jim. I think people like saying that they're bad. Uh, both Japanese developers like saying it and Western developers mm. like saying it. But they don't really mean it, and almost every time they say it, they'll they'll seem really happy in the act of saying it. Jonathan Blow did a video recently for uh, some video game website where he's like, I haven't played any Japanese video games in a while, and that's because they're not any good. However, they are still good, but I like <laughs> saying that they're not. For a second, I'm like, what? What? You're not making any sense. And uh, uh, let it be known that Jonathan Blow is one of the few human beings on the planet that actually inspires feelings of hostility mm. towards me. I, I, I know it's irrational. I can't help it, but I feel quite. I'm gonna have to stop you one second. Whoa, I'm sorry yes. about this. Just gonna make That's sure okay. I, I gotta make sure I turn the oven off. <laughs> <laughs> one second. Sure. Sure. In the meantime, I will let you know that I'm curled up in the corner. I've got three pillows, but I'm not sitting on them. I'm just near them. Instead, I'm sitting on a cold floor. 
thinking about how I could get those pillows underneath my uh, body, cause a cushioning effect between me and the floor, but uh, <laughs> not sure I'm going to do that. It seems like it might uh, come back to bite me in some way. What if I stink the pillows up with my dirty body? My butt might not be totally good smelling. All right now, I haven't smelled it. I can't reach. Try to smell my own bud. It uh, doesn't work. I can't get close enough to it. Just a few inches away. Though uh, sometimes when I get closer to the butt, I do start to smell something. But I'm not sure if it's the butt I'm smelling. It could be anything down there. It could be the thighs. It could be kneecaps. It could be the uh, the other stuff. The beans and franks there. Anything goes when you start smelling around there. So you know if you don't know how your butt smells. You don't know if you should put a pillow on it, so I'm just gonna sit on the floor. Maybe it'll stink up the floor. So let's wash it later. Jim, you're not back yet, are you? Oh, I am. I just <laughs> I had to let you carry on with that. Well, you know, I had to I had to keep the show going. <laughs> People like it when you're forced to talk on your own. Is that what they like now? I yeah, was... so I was like, well, you know, false alarm, oven was off, but let you talk for a little bit more. How 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 long were you gone for? You think? Uh, it took me less than seven seconds, I'd say. <laughs> that's that's pretty embarrassing. I'm sorry <laughs> to, to take up so much of the show. You were here. You could have been having a good time with it. I apologize. Uh, anyway. So, yeah, I was talking about Jonathan Blow and how he's one of the few human beings on the planet who actually makes me feel hostile. And it's irrational for me to feel hostile towards him because I don't really know him. Uh, he had sent me some really angry emails, which was a bad way to start off a relationship. Uh, He's done I did that a- to me as well. Has he really? Uh, he does that. That's what he does. He gets angry but at people. He tries to seem so, like, intellectual and measured and in control and rational in interviews. And then, you know, you write one thing you didn't like, and all of a sudden you get one of these, listen, idiot, you obviously don't know how to write. Time to go back to journalism school out of nowhere because you like just wrote one thing that disagreed with them. So anyway, that's one problem I have with them. <clears throat> but the, the real wounded problem... pride of a you know a self-styled intellectual is more vicious than any full-time idiot's anger. Yeah, I was, and I was. That goes along perfectly with what I was about to say, which is a well-spoken moron is much more dangerous than a, um, a smart person who just has trouble articulating their words, like like I, like I maybe am, because that wasn't a good way of putting it. But he says a lot of really stupid stuff very well. Like, he is very well-spoken. And to me, that's somewhat dangerous, particularly that he represents, to a lot of people, kind of one of the great minds of modern Western game design uh, because of one game, Braid, which is a pretty good game. It's uh, overrated, I think, but it's got some good design elements, but it's not some sort of beautiful masterpiece in terms of what message it sends. It's just kind of a good uh, time reversal 2D platformer. Uh, the storyline of it's actually a bit contrived, I think, but, uh, but besides all that... You know, because he made one game, people have decided he is kind of the go-to um, genius for talking about game design. And he kind of lives up to that reputation by sounding like he knows what he's talking about. But he, he's, in fact, kind of a moron a lot of the time. And that makes us look stupid, and, and it makes other people believe stupid things. And that bothers me. I feel feel threatened by his stupidness because it's going to make the world of video games a worse place. And one of the things he said, as I was saying before, is that um, Japanese video games aren't good anymore, but then said that, oh, actually, they are. Sorry. I just enjoyed saying that they're not. And I think the reason he enjoys saying that they're not good is because he is not a Japanese video game developer. And growing up, uh, most video game developers I know thought, well, I'm never going to make it big because all the big games are made by Japanese companies, and I'm never going to move to Japan other than the... uh, guy who made Star Fox, he did actually move to Japan to, uh, to try to get in the industry there. But, but um, yeah, it's very validating for Western developers to now say Japan isn't relevant anymore because what they're really trying to say is we are more relevant than them now, and that's very self-gratifying uh, to, to say out loud. But it's not necessarily true, I don't think. What do you think, Jim? 
Um, it's interesting. Uh, I like that yeah. theory as well. I like that theory. I think there is some validation there. Um, and I think there's also validation from, I think, indie developers. Not all of them. I think some indie developers have a chip on their shoulder. And I think that's evidenced yeah. by certain indie developers who will make one game, one successful game, and then proceed to spend uh, the next few years telling the rest of the industry <laughs> what to do and how they should do it. Uh, and that can range anywhere uh -huh. from, you know, John Blow saying, you know, the things he says to Rovio, the Angry Birds guy, um, giving Nintendo pointers on how to be successful in the video <laughs> game industry. Uh, you know, it's... <laughs> And some of the things yeah. they say might have merit, you know. Uh, I'm not saying, oh, you... You know, I haven't made any games. So, And I frequently talk about the industry like I know what I'm talking about. Um, it's not that it's uh, invalid, you know, whatever they have to say. Some of the things they say might have merit. But it's this... This idea that they are now the authority on where this business is headed. And it's usually always in their favour, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the indie dev is always right. Uh, consoles are dying. Mobile phones will take over everything in gaming. Um, and it's always from their own perspective, and it makes whatever they're doing sound better. Um, so I think, like you say, mm -hmm. there is that a lot of self-vindication and validation going on with these outspoken developers. And as far as the Japanese stuff goes, it's, it's, it's tough to tell. I mean, I think that globalization and the rise of the Western game um, has certainly gone some way towards diminishing Japan's influence. I think that's fair to mm -hmm. say. I think it's fair oh, to absolutely. say that, you know, the Japanese market has shrunk, if only because the industry itself got bigger. Uh, and, you know, you've got games like Halo, like Call of Duty, uh, like Gears of War, dominating the world now. Uh, whereas back in the old days, you know, Mario, Sonic... Uh, Final Fantasy, these Japanese games were the ones on top. Um, mm -hmm. I do see what some people say um, when they talk about... Um, and, and Japanese developers do this. I think Inafune is very outspoken about this, uh, as is... Uh, Mikami, I think? I think might uh, be... Maybe, yeah. He's, I, he's jumped to a bunch of different uh, yeah. publishing I think even Kojima... Even Kojima yeah. has said words to the effect of Japanese developers aren't feeling very brave. And I think mm. I think that some of the bigger games to come out of Japan definitely evidence that. Um, there are mm. a lot of RPGs that will just keep doing the same old shit. And not in terms of gameplay even. They will desperately try and alter the gameplay, even to the game's own detriment. But the stuff that I always find more important in an RPG, the story and the world... Total cookie cutter. You know, you will always have the, mm -hmm. the the young boyish video game protagonist who may or may not have lost his memory. The um, serious woman who wants to be taken seriously even though she's a woman and, oh my god, that's a, an epic role reversal um, and secretly loves the main character but doesn't want to show it. And then the ditzy big boobed one who will become part of the love triangle, you know? It's so the same. And I always point to Infinite Undiscovery. <laughs> Whoa, I don't even know that's, what that is. Is that, that good? That's the game that almost destroyed my love of an entire genre the same way the ending of Mass Effect 3 destroyed people's <laughs> love of the series. Uh, it is a game just so built around every cliche in Japanese role-playing games that it the knock-on effect of it made, the, made those plot points glaringly obvious in other Japanese role-playing games. Like, it made... It made the tropes so blatant that I could then just see them in every other Japanese role-playing game I played and almost right. ruined everything for me. And, and I think that's what a lot of developers are driving at when they don't feel very excited by Japanese development anymore because some of the big stuff out there is still trying to play it safe in terms of some of their most important elements and then making these like desperately weird changes elsewhere um, that indicate they don't really know what they're doing and they're panicking. Right. But by right. the same token, we then get very successful games like Demon Souls and Dark Souls mm -hmm. sure. um, that have come out and blown people's minds. And um, things like Binary Domain came out recently, which is one of the few Japanese games that try and copy quote unquote Western gameplay that worked really well. Um, mm -hmm. 
I do think there are still some great Japanese studios out there, some great Japanese minds, some really good visionaries over there. And I think a lot of it as well is there are a lot of young Japanese developers who are talented and maybe they're not getting where they want to be because of the old guys in charge. Um, yeah. Obviously, Japan, I just culturally, I think it's a lot more patriarchal and, and led by the, the stiffs in the suits. Um, mm-hmm. A bit more, at least creatively. Um, I mean, obviously, stiffs in suits control the Western market as well, but they... They don't dominate the creative part of it so much, and there are talk. There, you know, there was stuff like um, what was it, Dead Rising? Um, the guys that wanted to make Dead Rising two for a while were being blocked by the Capcom higher ups uh, because it was too Western and they didn't want to do it. Um, and I, I, I don't know how they managed to farm it out and get Dead Rising two made, but yeah, that took a while too. There was a it big took a while, span yeah. between, yeah, and in a few it worked really hard on making that happen it's always so weird to me it's like when a woman says uh you know i hate all women when a guy like he says japanese game development uh is in the decline like you are a japanese game developer though so are you saying you're in the decline or is it just everybody but you uh it's it's a weird statement to make but but what i take away from it is that like you're saying they're aware that the market has grown and they haven't grown with the market. The Japanese game development and game publishing has stayed around the same size, you know, from what I can tell, sales wise. Uh, games like Monster Hunter and stuff still sell really well in Japan, but haven't grown with the rest of the, the market and become global successes. And that's frustrating to them. And they're, like you said, they're frustrated with. The fact that the suits are pulling um, a lot of the strings and that they don't get the same budgets. Like it used to be that uh, Japanese game development back in the 8 bit days and 16 bit days was pretty cheap, so you could take a lot of risks. But now I'm getting that they're in this kind of middle ground where they don't get the Grand Theft Auto 5 or, um, you know, Mass Effect or Halo style budgets, but they aren't at an indie budget level either. They're stuck in this kind of middle ground where you kind of have the worst of both worlds um i know that's something that's frustrating to a lot of developers which are all fair things to to uh voice it's being frustrating but to say your whole game development culture sucks because you're frustrated by a few things just makes you look bad i think and uh causes people to be less confident that you're going to do anything good it's it's weird to me to to hear so many japanese game developers bash themselves because it just makes people think oh well i'll ignore your next game then i'll just play angry birds or call of duty instead which is exactly what they don't want i, th- I would think mm. right yeah yeah mm-hmm. i think another yeah. thing is like the big japanese companies you know your capcoms your konamis they're in weird positions right now you know they are Especially Konami, like you get the sense the company doesn't know what the fuck it's doing anymore. Um, yeah. and Capcom has obviously had a <laughs> string of issues with fans and, and whatnot. Um, whereas in the West, even Electronic Arts, as, as disgusting a company as it is, still manages to get away with all these blockbusters and games with huge fan followings. Um, and I don't think we, we see that so much in Japan. I think a lot of companies are sort of, they're floundering and the fans have noticed mm-hmm. more, maybe, um, or at least the market's noticed a bit more, um, and the developers have noticed. And I think a lot of times as well, in America, if a developer gets frustrated, he can set up an indie company, put something on Steam, get something, as we're finding out now, funded on Kickstarter or what have you, and get some real attention and do really well for himself. Mm-hmm. Um, and Japan, I I don't think it's quite got the same outlet because something like Steam is very Western oriented. It's yeah. yeah. I, I don't know if there's a Japanese equivalent, and I certainly don't know if if so many Japanese independent developers even think of something like Steam because I don't know how well it, it goes over there. But maybe there are like just as many creative independent developers as there are. You know, maybe Japan has plenty of John Blows and. Um, mm. Yeah, that's the thing. From what I've heard, they're really the gaming is like a non-entity in Japan, and download services sell way, way less. You know, obviously Xbox uh, 360 is is um, you know more or less dead in the water in Japan, and PSN games and WiiWare games just don't 
do that well. I think the eShop is starting to pick things up a little bit. But for whatever reason, that purchase model just doesn't fly with um, Japanese culture, which is a shame. And it also doesn't really make any sense because... Um, you know, the country is still pretty crowded and space is always an issue. Most people have much smaller apartments and everything's just kind of condensed over there. So not having to have physical media, you'd think they'd love it, but yeah. so far so bad when it comes to that. Yeah. And I think that definitely harms the indie sort of field, playing field over there. Um, makes it oh, sure. more difficult for them to um, resonate and, and find people. And maybe there are people with the kind of vision that western indie devs have they just got no outlet for it and maybe some of them are forced to work with these big companies that don't treat them so well maybe comments uh, from japanese developers that slag off the japanese market comes not from a genuine sense that they believe there are no visionaries in japan but more that mm -hmm. those visionaries have nowhere to go and you know that might be something that's worth thinking about there that there should be a, an outlet for independent japanese development to to thrive more and there should be more of a, a drive to expose japanese consumers to new ways of getting content via digital distribution and what have you uh, rather than doing everything the traditional way because i've said before the one of the biggest threats to this market's growth is the, the constant reliance on the age-old developer-publisher relationship. And we need to break that mm -hmm. down a lot more so we're not relying on one conduit through which to get our games made. And in Japan, that seems to be a bit harder. Um, and that might yeah, be where the absolutely. Japanese complaints are coming from. And when someone like John Blow complains uh, about Japanese gaming... It's not so much that he thinks people, you know, people in Japan suck at making games. It's he's got no way of seeing what they can truly do and and the truly inventive right. ideas they can come up with because there's no outlet for it. So you know, who knows? I mean, I sense a lot of frustration from Japanese developers, and maybe there are things they can't tell us that that go on behind the scenes that make it so difficult to get certain types of games made. Um, that's nothing we can ever know for sure until someone really blows yeah. the lid on it. But you get this sense that people aren't happy making games over there, um, which is why I don't think it's totally unfair to criticize someone who says Japanese games um, aren't doing so well. Uh, I mm -hmm. think it is very ignorant to just straight up say, oh, they all suck, because that's not true. But just judging by how many people... Just, just the fact this debate exists seems to imply there is an issue there at the heart of Japanese game making that needs mm -hmm. to be addressed. I think there's something in Japan that needs to be addressed and sorted out that possibly some people are turning a blind eye to. Yeah, that's a much better way of looking at it. I wish you did all the talking for Jonathan Blow because what he was saying is he doesn't get the same sense that you can just like discover in a, in gaming the japanese games don't let you just discover it anymore that they handhold too much and that they are um you know not as uh, imaginative and geez i really don't see it that way at all especially compared to most um western games which i feel like there's plenty of handholding and tutorials in in western games and also just not a whole lot of discovery in a lot of, of big name Western games or any big yeah. budget game for that. Well, matter. I think that's the irony. Um, the irony yeah. is that a lot of what you know, blow the blows of the world would say about Japan, they probably say in a different seminar about a, like the leading Western games. They probably have the exact same criticisms, and what they really mean to say, of course, is independent development is where it's at that's where all the experimentation is going i think that's what this really at the heart of this that's where it's leading it's just yeah. them saying independent development is where it's at and there might be a little truth to that you know there are very exciting experimental projects coming out of indie development most of it's shit i'm sorry you know we can't just pretend we can't pretend that triple a game development is any less prone to bullshit than a lot of what comes out of the indie circle, and no more derivative. There are many indie games that just look derivative, and I did um, a Jimquisition on this this week about art games, about how many of them just fucking copy each other, no, in no yeah. more grotesque a way than, you know, Medal of Honor or Copy Call of Duty or a cover-based mm -hmm. shooter will st steal things from Gears of War. You know, there are only so many times you can play a game where you walk from point A to point B while a story is just thrown at you before you say, I've played this before. 
many times. And but at the you know there are sorry I'm going going on a tangent. Um, there are there may be truth to the fact that obviously there's a, a buzzing indie scene with some very exciting stuff going on. Um, and I think that's what they really mean because a lot of the criticisms criticisms people have about Japan are also ones people have about Western gaming. And maybe there are Japanese yeah. developers out there, indie Japanese developers, who say all of the West games suck because they haven't gotten to play the Western indie games that they would love. Mm, that's a good point. Yeah, there is a lot of discrimination against Western games in Japan, and I think most of those people have not played anything on Xbox Live Arcade for the most part. So, so you got them. You got them. But come on, there's some. you like Japanese video games still, right, Jim? You like a couple of them? Yeah, still like them. I yeah. I yeah, like I said, I mean, to say all of Japan's games suck is untrue. Um, I think again, like indie devs are just they're just railing at the AAA game business worldwide, mm. and they've isolated it to right. Japan because they can't name any good Japanese indie games. Uh, but no, it's untrue to say that all of Japan's games suck um, because. I, you know, I recently was very praiseworthy of Binary Domain, Resident Evil Revelations, Dark Souls. There are plenty of Japanese games that have come out that I really like. Uh, and there are plenty of games that have come out in the West that I really like, both AAA and indie. So Yeah, it just depends on if it's good. Yeah. I notice people t- tend to not factor Nintendo as a game developer into the whole discussion. When people say, well, look at how much uh, Japanese games they just don't sell anymore. And they're like, oh, what about all those Nintendo games? Ah, oh, well, they're they're not really Japanese. They're like from another planet, kind of a thing. Have you ever noticed that people don't really look at them as existing in the same world? Well, no, as, I mean uh, the rest of us. Nintendo's yeah. such an anomaly; it can simultaneously prove and disprove anything you want about the game industry. <laughs> and I think that throws a bit of a spanner in the works when you're trying to say that all of Japan's games uh, suck and are terrible and have no business um, being released. And then you see the genuinely interesting things that Nintendo can do still. Um, obviously, you super. Or or action. when they're they're sucky, yeah, and they'll suck and make tons of money too. Every once in a while. Or they'll be really great and make no money. You're right. Everything you think you know gets cancelled out by something Nintendo did. Yeah. Wow. Like I've said before. The unprovable. <laughs> yeah. I've said before Say Nintendo is a weird bubble. Like it just exists in this weird universe, subtly influencing everything while interacting with nothing. Nintendo is the silent hill of the video game industry drawing people in and making them face their darkest nightmares and then spitting them back out as changed, twisted individuals. That's Nintendo, and you do not look into it for it will look back at you. <laughs> wow, that's uh, the, the coolest thing anyone said about Nintendo in a long time, because most people you know, either hate Nintendo, which is kind of... Uh, how, how, what's the word you use? Gauche? Ga- gosh? Gauche. I've used, Ga- that's the third Ga- time I've said it. Gauche. It's a great word. I'm going to try to pick it up. It's a bit... Uh, say it again? Gauche. Ghost? Gauche. Ghost. It's a bit gauche to... <laughs> <laughs> to say you hate Nintendo, it's also a bit uh, gauche to say you do like them. There's. It's very hard to find a, a ground that doesn't annoy people when you talk about them. Uh, but you just did it. You equated them to a black hole of existence that will funnel whatever you are as a being into itself, distort it, uh, destroy it, rebuild it, and bring it out. Uh, something totally new. That's a great analogy, Jim. Good job. Ah. Uh... <laughs> That uh, that Xenoblade Chronicles is coming out soon. That's a JRPG, and I was just reading an interview with a guy who made it, who says he really means it as an apology for what JRPG has come to mean in the United States. He said, "Quotes uh, Japanese made RPGs has become a form of mockery, and that uh, there are many games that have given up on trying to evolve." But uh, he's trying to to take that back with Xenoblade. So hopefully that'll be good. I've played the game for about 12 hours. I really liked it, but unless I'm reviewing it, I'm never going to play the whole thing, unfortunately. I just don't have the time. Or uh, Were you planning on reviewing that one, Jim? Actually, it's coming out, I think, uh, next month. Yeah, I may do. I may do. I'm very interested in it, especially with that 
MO of his because as much as I've liked quite a few Japanese games, I must say the the last JRPG on a home console I truly enjoyed was Lost Odyssey. And I was fuck, I was back in England when that came out in two thousand seven. Yeah, it was two thousand seven. Yeah, something mm-hmm. ridiculous. And I haven't enjoyed a JRPG on a home console since. Um there's been some DS ones I liked, you know, I liked the um the the latter Suikoden. I love Dragon mm-hmm. Quest Nine. But mm-hmm. you know, Final Fantasy, I'm I, I, I can't get into that one anymore. It's been bogged down by its own pompousness. Yeah. Other things like Infinite Undiscovery, you no, know, and then Triace just fucking burn that company to the ground. So oh. I'm really looking forward to like Xenoblade and the Last Story. Those games have been what I've been looking t- forward to um, as the saving grace of of a genre I used to adore. I used to to love it back uh, last generation. I was almost always had a, a JRPG on the go, whether it was an older Final Fantasy or something like Shadow Hearts. Um, but now, like, I haven't played and enjoyed one, on, on, again, on a home console since Lost Odyssey. Yeah. How, about, how much of it do you think is just when you get older, you're not as easily impressed with the stuff that you used to like when it's just kind of regurgitated at you? I feel like that might be a big part of it. Because I, you know how hard I am to please at this point with anything that's kind of traditional. Uh, and I've, it's not because I've never liked it. I've, I've liked uh, war-based first-person shooters before. I've liked JRPGs before. I've liked uh, just about everything. But after a certain point, unless it's really doing something you haven't seen before, it's hard to get as excited about it. And I think yeah. I'm getting at that point with JRPGs. Like, just... Yeah. The way a JRPG tells its story, it just... I've gotten bored of that, and I want to see a different way of, of telling that story. Um, well, no, I want to see a different story told. Like I said mm. earlier, I don't want the fucking boy protagonist and the, you know, the same characters over and over again. You know, if I see yeah. one more fucking character whose best contribution to any dialogue is smarmily going <laughs> every now and then, you know, just <laughs> fucking stop with that. But you can get into the kind of lost in translation weirdness that comes from a JRPG or any Japanese game, right? Because that's that's one of the things I really liked about Xenoblade from what I played of it. It just felt like um, a kung fu movie sort of uh, dubbing. You know, you know that's not what they really meant to say. Unintentionally funny sort of English stuff uh, that I, I I never get sick of that. So hopefully you like that stuff. Oh yeah, I mean, you... having fun, that's another thing. Like JRPGs now, so few of them have fun with mm. their story and their world. It's always so po-faced and oh, maybe I believe in everything or maybe I believe in nothing. Oh. You know, it's just all that fucking waffly, pretentious, miserable shit. Just miserable all of the time. Right. And 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 it's been, again, Lost Odyssey was a game that had fun. Like, its main character was a bit too... It's, again, that sour, po-faced protagonist that I've gotten so fucking sick of. But that was beautifully offset by Jansen, who is still one of the funnest characters... Uh, a video game has ever had. Uh, Jansen was fucking magnificent, and a few of the other characters were quite sort of cool and interesting as well. Um, and that's what I want. I want Japanese role-playing games with f- good characters and fun characters and stories that aren't the same as everything else. Yeah, yeah. and I'm well, sick of the you... brooding misery of Japanese role-playing game characters. It's been done, and I'm fucking sick of them. Yeah, you're on to them. You know they don't really mean anything by it. It's just uh, what they know works with that audience. So so it's uh, boring. But uh, I think you'll like Xenoblade. Not as much as you like Jansen, but you'll like it a good amount. Um, they're not brooding. And they should be more brooding, because they're like about to die. But And they're all British, which is fun, too. So they'll just be like, hey, want to go kill some monsters? It'll be a good time. We'll go in a cave. It's like, <laughs> yeah, let's go to that cave. That'll be fun. Like, why? <laughs> I'm so excited about the cave. That's the kind of thing I like about the game, anyway. And it's got a huge, huge world. It's very much about being in the world, which is, uh, as you know, 
takes place on the corpse of two gods who are battling um and somehow their battle stopped right in the right before the end of it and all this life just kind of blossomed on top of their corpses so um that's what you get to explore on you know god's uh armpit and stuff like that it's pretty fun that's good i mean i'm really looking forward to it because i think they're genuinely it looks like a game that wants to enjoy itself and and, and yeah, let you enjoy right. it i mean because i mean a lot of this goes back to final fantasy 7 i think a lot of people think that ruined it it had the brooding protagonist it had the dark end of the world feeling and this oppression and everything but even final fantasy 7 had a laugh even clouds oh sure cracked a joke now and then and it seems people forgot that and they think jrpgs have to always be this <laughs> when it's I no, think it, no we don't need that. I, I think it might come from their insecurity i mean they have all this money JRPGs are pretty expensive to make a lot of the time because they've got a big world and a lot of CG and even voice acting. So they've got this insecurity because they've got this huge budget and they want to make sure that it's got meaning and depth and is going to be taken seriously. So they just make everyone depressed and sad and it uh, it backfires on them big time, I think. Hopefully they'll learn that. Um, that's the other thing that's different about Xenoblade is it's a way cheaper game. It looks like a PS2 game. Even uh, by Wii standards, it doesn't look like um, it's trying to impress all that much. But it's still quite nice to look at in terms of the, the design, even if it's low budget mm. on the whole. You know, Eye so. direction trumps everything. Yeah, I agree. You know, if, it, yeah. if you came up with a good design you can get away with not looking so good on a technical standpoint, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah. You know, you can have a beautiful looking game, but if they look like characters you've seen in a dozen other games, what's the point? You know, what's the point of being pretty? But yeah, you know, looking forward to Xenoblades, looking forward to more JRPGs, hopefully in the future that just aren't miserable all the time. And I'm not saying don't have any tragedy. I said early, you know, I like bleak stuff. I like tragic stuff, but when the entire genre almost is drowning in its own self-pity, mm. any tragedy that you hope to go for loses its bite. It loses its sting when everything's miserable all of the time. There's no, there's no hope lost when you've had no hope to begin with. And that's right. something that's infected, you know, Final Fantasy more recently. It's infected... Uh, some of the tri stuff that's come out, fucking Infinite Undiscovery. Um, and then you get something like Dragon Age. Uh, no, not Dragon Age, Dragon Quest, which is mm -hmm. a very cartoony world with very silly monsters. And then when something serious happens in that, you're like, holy shit, that means something. You know, because this <laughs> yeah. is a cartoon world where some like serious shit just went down. That shocks that is shocking. Um, it's not shocking when it happens in a game where everyone's got a permanent grimace etched onto their impossibly porcelain faces. Wow, good one. I'm with you 100% on that. Speaking of porcelain faces, how's that Blades of Time treating you? That was a big epic moment when you finally got oh, your hands yeah. on that game. Couldn't yeah, believe you it. got it. We did it, got guys. It. <laughs> it's... <laughs> It's really not worth tracking down. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of not bad, right? It's yeah, that's it. That's how I just it's kind of not bad. It is full of terrible ideas. Um, oh, but it that's too it bad. does its best. <laughs> Sorry, I'm hiccups. It it's doing oh, it's doing its best. It's just got the wrong idea most of the time. Um, most of the time. Oh, that's I, yeah. That's a lot of the time. Yeah. If it was twenty bucks cheaper, it would have. I think it would be a serviceable game. I think at forty bucks, um, even though that's budget status, I think they're still asking a bit too much uh, for twenty dollars. Uh, Hack and Slash Fan will have a lot of fun with that, and I think its price has been reduced already. Um, Whoa! It is worth checking out for for around twenty, but any more than that, I would say just just leave it for now. Um, but it's, you know, they genuinely try their best and they've got some interesting ideas and when it works, it works very well. Um, okay. but you know, just like the boss fights, there was this one, like the main gimmick is rewinding time and you'll make a clone of yourself that performs your past action. 
and you can keep doing that. So you could eventually, like, if you keep attacking one guy, then rewinding, attacking, rewinding, eventually, you know, you've got half a dozen clones surrounding an enemy, all doing maximum damage. And Whoa. that's pretty cool, but then they, like, really ham-fistedly force it into the game and kind of spoil any clever ideas they could have had for it. Like, there's one boss fight against a guy with an energy tank on his back that keeps regaining his health. And the directions the game itself gives you, like the this narrator helpful character is like, um, use your time ability to destroy the pack on his back. So you instantly think, <laughs> I'll distract him with a clone, then mm. get behind him and attack the thing, and then mm -hmm. eventually mm -hmm. damage the, the pack and destroy him. And that's not what you do. What they really mean is clone yourself so many times and just keep spamming it that you will lower his health more quickly than he can regenerate it. And that's basically what the game is. That's that's all it is. It's just keep spamming rewind and hope for the best. Uh, which, Whoa. it just leads half the that's time. That's bad. Yeah, half the fights I won, and then I just thought, so what was the pattern? What, what did I do there? I, I don't feel like I, like I was rewarded for working something out so much as just spamming mm -hmm. and spamming and hoping it worked. Uh, which ah. is a bit of an issue, but I, I, it's certainly not so bad that Konami should have actively hidden it. And even if it, <laughs> even if it was, why were they publishing it? I'm thinking this might end, be my yeah. next Inquisition. It's just asking Konami what the fuck they're playing at. I've, had, I've, <laughs> I've really had it with them. I'm not even joking. I have, I have had it with Konami, and it's not just because. One of their PR reps called me Jeff the other day, and I got a package from them today that was addressed to Jim Silver. <laughs> it's also not for the fact that I they respond to maybe 10% of any email I give them, even when it's important stuff. It's not just for the fact their press site sucks. Um, it's stuff like the Blades of Time thing, where they will announce a game three days after it was allegedly released. Um... Releasing Metal Gear Solid uh, HD collection on the same day as Modern Warfare 3 and doing it in such limited quantities that I literally could not find a limited edition of it in my state. Uh, wow. It is releasing three Silent Hill games in one month. <laughs> That's really weird. The, uh, the Vita one, um, Downpour, and the collection, is that right? And the HD collection, uh, which yeah. was originally scheduled for last week on the same day as Mass Effect 3, and it seems that in a rare display of understanding that the video game industry isn't just Konami doing it for a hobby, <laughs> they actually decided to move something. Um, possibly not wise to keep it all in the same month. I mean, they called no, it... No, no. They've called this... They, they're trying to make it like a campaign, like a promo thing, calling it the Month of Madness. And I don't think they realise the irony in the fact that what they're doing is literally insane. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I might go on a rant about that because I think... I just... I don't understand. I've never seen a company self-sabotage to the degree that Konami... It just... Konami's just been on this weird self-destructive streak lately. Haven't they? It's a, and for as long as I've been in Detoid, I've seen them like slowly but surely. Like their standards for their own behavior seems to change, and they're just like falling farther and farther from anything that you would consider like a professional video game publisher. It's weird. It's weird. Why are they doing this? Are it, are they just the Metal Gear company? In their own minds now? Is it because Lost in Shadow didn't sell well enough and a bunch of the other games didn't sell well enough that they're just like, oh, we'll just make Metal Gear and in the meantime we'll just kind of goof off. But even then, have you have you played um, Metal Gear Snake Eater 3D? Metal Gear uh, Solid Snake Eater 3D? No, I, I, I mailed you with my uh, one. Yeah, I'm playing it and the review hopefully will be done uh, soon. I got it fairly recently. I, I think they sent it to you after the game was already at retail, unfortunately. Of course um, they did. But it's just... <laughs> yeah, That's it's what they do weird... now. Sorry. Yeah. They, they failed in so many weird little ways. I mean, it's still Metal Gear Solid 3, so it's still... Uh, a great game at its core, but the package that uh, that game has been delivered us in is just like, like they, it's almost like they got it to a beta phase, and then heard the PlayStation Vita was coming out, and they're like, oh, 
well, we'll just put the HD collection on the Vita. Do we even need to finish this? Uh, eh, just put it out like this. It'll be fine. Yeah, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, the frame rate is all screwed up half the time, and there's no... Um, it's kind of standard in, in games on handheld, especially, where you don't always have the uh, same amount of buttons. To have one button to quickly snap the camera behind your back, there's no button like that, so you're constantly spinning the camera around in order to get it just right, and you spin the camera around with the X, Y, A, and B buttons. It's like, you didn't want to map that to something else? No, no, it'll be fine. And you can't <laughs> you can't change any of that. And they've, they've taken out little details that people love about the game. Um, you, you probably know in Snake Eater, there's a scene where I believe it's right when you get captured. If you save the game and turn it off and then turn it back on when you reboot you're in um you're in a, a dream that snake is having yeah you know about this stuff yeah that's just taken out like, i'm not even sure i'm not even sure that's in the hd collection because i tried to duplicate really? i played and i'm sure ah. i had the right spot because i'd done it many times in the past but i it didn't yeah. come up for me and i haven't heard reports of it coming up for anyone else so, weird. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, I don't know if there's some weird licensing thing that went on, but I thought Kojima had created that whole thing himself, like it was some unused concept or something. Yeah, it's uh, it's Snake with like kind of giant hooks, almost like swords crossed with a Candyman hook, and he's killing like sort of weird zombie dudes with other hooks, right? Something like that. Yeah, I think it was that's supposed like... to be some vampire themed game at one point. Oh, all right, all right. Huh. Well, all right. That makes me feel a little less bad that they probably won't get that on the Vita HD collection of Metal Gear. Um, maybe that's just a thing you'll only get on the PS2, but it's weird to have them take stuff like that out um, when they're trying to resell you a game you probably already have to to give you a diminished version of it um, instead of an enhanced version. It's just yeah. weird thinking. Well, I mean, it was fucking stupid to... I mean... They've delayed Snake Eater 3D to the point where the HD collection already came out, and it was like, I was really excited right. for Snake Eater 3D, but mm-hmm. I only recently played it on the HD collection. It's like, fuck, I, do, I don't want to go out and buy it again now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Even if it were, I mean, maybe you'd only want it on a portable, so, so you could rationalize it as, eh, this is the one I'll play on the train, but then they announced the uh, the HD collection coming to the Vita, so... Unless you only have a 3DS and no PlayStation 2 or PlayStation 3 or PlayStation Vita, it's really hard to recommend this version um, that Konami made. And it's all because of Konami's doing that you can't really recommend it. It's weird weird stuff they're doing. Hope they're okay. It's kind of like a friend that you're like, eh, you're losing weight? You don't really talk much anymore. (laughs) You're leaving the house? It's like, are you all right? I I hope they're all right. I hope they don't suddenly... Well, anyway, Silent Hill and Metal Gear are two of my favourite series of all time. Silent Hill 2 is is Mm -hmm. my favourite video game of all time, and Snake Eater might be at number two. And Mm -hmm. to have Konami just just publicly humiliate itself constantly. The only theory I've got is, you remember their press conference at E3 2010? With one million troops and very very exercise and and people <laughs> people that yeah. stumbled on stage not knowing what they were doing or, or saying. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, I go rewatch that and it's not Tak Fuji and it's not the the other guy, the dance guy, who are the the most embarrassing part of that presentation. The white guy with the um, guy doing the dance guy is just so uncomfortable and is trying to tell badly scripted jokes. It is painful to watch. I, that guy is amazing. But something tells me maybe they saw the internet talk about like that video and how footage of that Konami press uh, conference went viral. And maybe mm-hmm. they thought that was their recipe for success for the rest of their like the rest of Konami's <laughs> existence is this Kaufman-esque staged failure and they think they're being clever by releasing Silent Hill three times in one month and doing, you know, making their games unavailable for purchase. They think, man, we're driving demand by being viral and ironic. <laughs> it might be working. I mean, the amount of press they got out of Blades of Time from Destructoid is, um, you know, you can't really pay for that. And I'm sure, and people were saying that they bought it just because you couldn't find it. Yeah, I, I saw a few people say that. Yeah, I was retweeting a lot of like photos people had taken of themselves picking the game up. 
<laughs> yeah, it was a victory. Their their failure to actually sell their game made it a victory for us to actually find it. Hmm. Could be a weird reverse psychology technique. Yeah. Good Maybe they're not uh-huh. dicks after all. <laughs> yeah, let's hope not. I hope not. We should try to get Talk Fuji on uh on Pod Toy. If we're gonna have celebrities on, he loves you now. He won't. Let's do it. He- <laughs> Really, he... He won't bother reading. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I don't even think he, he likes me, okay. I am. No, no, you're Jim Silver to him, probably. <laughs> he, he's fine. We, we, met, <laughs> we met at E3 last year. We got along really well. He, like, rubbed his dreadlocks against me, and we, we just talked about Frogger and stuff. He's a very nice guy. He's uh, well-meaning, and he really tries hard. I don't think he's given the the tools that he really needs to make quality games a lot of the time though. He's handed a lot of uh a lot of what they call stacked decks where he's bound to lose no matter what he yeah. does. Well I mean his name's attached to things like um ninety nine knights and frog three uh-huh. D, both of which uh-huh. are dreadful. <laughs> Poor man. Poor guy. Yeah. But he, he has is the fun. one who had He does. He does. He makes the most of it and um people love him for it. He should probably just like host an American Idol type show or something <laughs> and get out of the whole game development thing. Because as a personality, he's fantastic. But as a game developer, he keeps just getting handed uh, bad cards, I think. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Tell you yeah. what, though. Yep. I got something that will succeed. Is that right? Yep. <laughs> what uh, is it? Imagine, if you will, uh-huh. right? This could, yeah. this this all shit all over John Carter at the box office. It's a Will oh, wow. the movie. <laughs> You're doing this still? <laughs> yeah, I'm persisting, <laughs> even though the quality has clearly gone off from when we last did it. That's okay. I enjoy it so far. Yeah, I like it. Do it. Defoe really District. Or <laughs> no, dis- District Defoe, right? It's just got the actor's name in the in the <laughs> in the title. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so District of Foe. District I'm with of you. Foe. The year is the far future of 2014. <laughs> New York City has been wiped out by a 200 year long nuclear war. <laughs> the citizens are all mutant y and shit. And people are dying off radiation until. A mysterious man with a vision builds a city far above the wastes of New York. Above? Above. Is it a floating city? Wow. The city okay. is supported by four limbs, right? That, like, stretch down <laughs> the sky into human limbs? wastes. Yes! Human limbs! <laughs> For indeed the city is a giant steel Willem Dafoe. <laughs> I give you District Dafoe, a post-apocalyptic film set in a city shaped like Willem Dafoe with a big head that looks from left to right, just looking at the rest of America going, ah, ah, I'm Willem Dafoe! Ah, really loud, so it like hurts the ears of everyone living in uh, District Dafoe. <laughs> Is it alive, District of Foe? Is it is it sentient or is it just a a, a very well made facsimile? It's a of very well made um, animatronic <laughs> city of Willem Dafoe. The sun so, York City. Because, because I was thinking, you know, okay, so maybe Willem Dafoe became metal and saved the the world, or at least saved the people from District of Foe by becoming a city. That that makes sense a little bit, <laughs> but why? Why would anyone make their savior city a giant screaming <laughs> William Defoe? Willem Defoe. Not, why would they want? Why would they want to subject? Well, I'm not you know, done the last yet. Of the human race? <laughs> I'm not done yet, right? Okay. Yep. For indeed, many migrated up the big elevator that goes up, <laughs> goes up Willem Defoe's metal left leg. From the city below, the blasted nuclear wastes below, up into, like, up the leg, and it goes up his bum, up his metal bum, right? 
and that's yeah. like where the big meeting place is. So, and they all go in there and they repopulate the world in Willem Dafoe, the big metal district Dafoe, right? Uh-huh. I'll admit, I haven't properly thought this one through. I, it was mostly yesterday when I was getting out the bath, <laughs> just thinking about this, and then I didn't think about it any more beyond that. Um, but for a while, everyone's happy in District of Five. It's like, yay, yay, you've saved our lives. Um, thank you, mysterious benefactor. And that's it, because yeah. the city is ruled by a mysterious benefactor who only appears with like a cloth mask over his head, a bit like Cobra Commander, but changed just enough so we don't get sued for copyright infringement. And he speaks with like a. Does he sound like Cobra Commander? He speaks yeah, with he an altered voice recorder, like in uh, Scream, right? We'll probably get the same guy that did the voices for um, the killers in Scream, right? And he okay. tells them to live, um, and all they've got to do to stay in District of Poe is to not violate the rules. Trouble is, no one told anyone what the rules are. And soon, there is government oppression from the Defoe bots. What? An army of policing yeah. robots that look like Willem Dafoe <laughs> and their heads spin around, just constantly spinning, just going, <laughs> and that's how you know they're coming and it will be a very tense and scary part of the film because the Freedom Fighters, okay, led by Bren- Freedom Fighters, Fre- Freedom Fighters led by Brendan Fraser. Oh no. And he is such a non-entity in terms of having any personality. I'm sorry, go ahead. Brendan, Brendan Fraser, Fraser is yes, the leader of the resistance, and he is joined by Harry Potter. And... <laughs> <laughs> Just Harry Potter. The different actor, but the, <laughs> but the character from the... Oh, no, 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 it's, it is Harry Potter, you know, the actor of Harry Potter, but the character is also oh, okay. Harry Potter in it. <laughs> But he doesn't have okay. a scar. Yeah, he doesn't have a scar and he's not a wizard, but he is Harry Potter and he is played by Harry Potter. And the sexy chick um, mm-hmm. who, you know, you have to have in a film is Deborah Messing from Will and Grace. <laughs> she's like, she's older than me and she's not uh, <laughs> trouble to look at, but... She would be your your starlet, your kind of sex pot. Yeah. <laughs> People won't notice. I'm gonna draw a pair of tits on her forehead in like permanent marker pen, so they will just see that and they'll think, you know, obviously vital young teenage attractive woman, like what we're seeing in her? Hollywood. <laughs> What? So that in the movie, she just has like a black magic marker drawing of tits on her forehead, and it's just unexplained. Oh no, no, no it's explained. Oh, okay. Is yeah. it good? You troublemakers. We- troublemakers are branded with a tattoo on their forehead, right? Um, a big curvy W for Willem, and two circles in between the curvy bits to represent infinity. For the eternal <laughs> punishment that they get, okay? And that's what they get for first-time offenders. And then if they break the rules one more time, they will just be thrown out of Willem, like, District of Foe's butt in, down into the nuclear waste below, where they will obviously die from the fall. Right, sure. Well, but and they, the, even if the, they survive. Yeah. yeah. Well, the thing is, it, it, it is so nuclear outside of District of Foe that they will mutate as they fall, and it'll be a really cool special effect as people grow, like, basically turn into a squid um, (laughs) as they hit the ground. And because they've turned into squids, you know, their bones are, like, non-existent. So they survive, and below District of Foe is just a sea of squid, like, living in in (laughs) the air. What? They're just floating around, just like uh, baking pies and getting married and uh, having a life, just sea squids. No, they just uh, scream. Squid? They just scream. <laughs> so much scream. 90% of the audio of this movie is just going to be. Or. It's just. It's going to be the most troubling. Um, auditory experience oh, yeah, well, you can, you can yeah, ask for. Don't, don't forget that throughout the entire movie, just in the background, you can constantly hear I'm Willem Dafoe! 
giant metal head just looking just around with those eyes. Red yeah, glowing those... eyes. Because two fur that's where the city's like furnaces are that power the city, they're in his eyes. And like the <laughs> the waste of the city comes out of his mouth, so he's got this big black smoking mouth and fiery eyes, and he's just going, Oh, oh. I'm well out of <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. I'm picturing the head being upside down, too, like uh, when the guys from um, Deadly Premonition come at you. It's a little creepier because they're mm. coming at you like bent backwards. Every, yeah, but you can do it either way. But, I think every 20 yeah. minutes it goes upside down to, <laughs> to let just, the smoke just sort of billow up. And then he's just ah, like that, upside down. And the head <laughs> wobbling left and right to make it scary. It is massive, this city, by the way. I mean, it is I'd as big imagine. as Willem Dafoe. Just imagine a metal Willem Dafoe as big as New York. You've just imagined District Dafoe. So anyway, the point is, these freedom fighters, throughout the course of the movie, they get in fights with the Dafoe bots. They liberate the people. They rise them up. And then they break into the Citadel of the mysterious benefactor, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they spin the chair around and they pull the hood off. Fuck. It's Willem Dafoe. Oh, really? And they're like, holy shit, I thought you were <laughs> dead. Because this is the far future, and Willem Dafoe was obviously famous in 2012, and this is the far future where everyone's dead. Right? In 2013. Right. And he's like... <clears throat> No, 14. I didn't die. Fourteen. No, I didn't <laughs> die. And then, <laughs> and then the credits roll, and that's the end of the film. That's the end. That's the end. <laughs> wow, wow. Is that letting someone know that you're alive or that you didn't die? Is uh, you know, it's okay to do, depending on the conversation. But to end a movie on that. Ooh, that's really going to uh, leave people hanging. No, I'm alive. <laughs> no, it's you got to get this right because this is going to be quoted up there with, you know, I am your father and whatever Indiana Jones might have said. Well, a famous movie quote like, you know, I had his liver with yeah. wine and some beans. Sure, I'll be back. It's, you know, that, he uh, looks he uh, looks up, right, with a big grin, and his hands just sort of wave up and down. <laughs> his hands wave up and down. <laughs> and he pisses himself. <laughs> what? Why? Is he scared or is he just excited? <laughs> to, just get inside, just doesn't mind? to get inside their minds. <laughs> He it's, a, it's a psychological trickery. <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> and he goes, oh, I'm not dead. And then the credits roll. And then the credits roll. And he plays that theme tune from American Beauty so that the audience knows it was deep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I, I think it sounds better than being John Malkovich overall. I think it's a, being John Malkovich is a really good movie, but if you're gonna, that's a, that's a good idea. Gonna, that is a great. We'll call the film "Being John Malkovich Two: District of Fun," <laughs> and it'll be like a spiritual sequel. Like, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. The spirit's there for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Oh, I can't That's believe great... I almost was too scared to say that one because it was shit. <laughs> you evolved it on in real time in the show as we were talking about it into something that uh, it's definitely worth making. I hope Willem Dafoe uh, I mean, just that, hears that it. That twist, you know, like that is oh, yeah. Yeah. that is M Night Shyamalan stuff, <laughs> you know. <laughs> kind of jazz that... hands up in the air a little bit. He's wearing the robe. You see the urine start to just run down yeah. from the crotch of the robe. And then it cuts, <laughs> it cuts, it cuts to uh, Harry Potter at that point, who just says, oh my god, he's pissing himself <laughs> like that. And then Deborah Messing just kind of gags a bit. Just, and she goes, it stinks like rotten beef like that. Oh, he's 
It stinks of rotten beef. And then Brendan Fraser says, I thought you were dead! <laughs> because he's Scottish in this one, right? <laughs> I didn't tell you that. And he's screaming it. Yeah. He's, scr- he's Brendan... Willem Dafoe is right next to him, and he's yeah. just screaming at him. Brendan yeah, of course character, of course, is called Ginger Bonnie Scotland in this. <laughs> and he's got ginger hair and a beard, and he goes, I thought you were dead! And then Willem Dafoe goes, No, I'm not dead! <laughs> and then American Beauty music, credits roll, audience. By that point, they've probably pissed themselves as well. Oh, sure, sure. And it probably now, just stinks of old urine in that movie theater. <laughs> it's a weird movie theater to go to, that it's playing that movie, for one, and for two, <laughs> everyone that goes there just just pees all over the place. Yeah, uh, I should go there. Oh, speaking of which, it's a PAX East teaser. Hey, guys, if you're going to PAX East... Turns out that me and another uh, Destructoid editor and Afflixus editor, Matthew Razak. Is that how I say his name, Jim? Razak? Razak? I always called him him Razak. Razak. I've known him for five years, but I don't want to say his last name. We are going to be hosting the movie FP, I think it's called. It's that one that uh, takes place in the future. I think it's like 2014, like uh, District of Foe. And it... Is like, in so, a world sorry, sorry, where... like being John Malkovich 2, District <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, it's like being John Malkovich 2, District of Foe. The movie, uh, it's called, I think it's called FP. I, I should read into it a little bit more. I haven't been able to watch it myself yet. It takes place in a future where people don't settle their conflicts with violence or with words or with war or with, with anything else. They settle it with uh, Dance Dance Revolution. And they all dress like Tron, kind of, and dance around. Gonna be that's playing in like a major movie theater in Boston, uh, the A Theater in Boston at PAX East, and I will be hosting it with Matthew Razak. So come to that on Sunday. Uh, PAX East is coming up in a few weeks now. That's a thing. Weird, right? Yeah. Why am I? Why am I doing that? I, I, hey, I who knows? <sighs> I have no idea. They just said host it, and I'm like, sure. Thank Lucky you for asking great. me, but yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Awesome. Is that sounds like a Willem Dafoe movie pitch? To be honest, <laughs> a film yeah, it's a real like just settled with DDR. Yeah, and it's not called DDR. It's called like the FP, like the least memorable, marketable. Just a couple of letters that are so hard to remember after you've just heard them. Uh, I've no, I, I'm probably wrong. It might be the FD, actually. Jesus, I'll get back to you on that. But anyway, watch for the movie. Hopefully, it'll be funny, and I'll be there. I'll, I'll hug y'all. I'll buy y'all popcorn and hug you. It'll be great. Best movie ever saw. Uh, you're not going to Pax East, though, right, Jim? Uh, no. <clears throat> no, I don't think so. Sadly Believe not. It, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's only a half hour from my house, so. It's easy enough for me to do, and I'm excited about it. Max and Tara will be there. Uh, our old friend John Carnage will be there. Hamza will be there. I think Dale will be there. Uh, should be a lot of fun. I'm already gearing up for it, getting my cameramen ready to go and stuff like that. So hopefully I'll do stuff. Yeah. No, I probably won't see you in real life, Jim, <clears throat> until E3. That's. How... I think E3 is the nearest how... one, yeah. yeah I, I yeah. dislodged a lot of fluid by doing Willem Dafoe impressions. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if you can hear me coughing in the background, I do apologize. Brittle bits of grit, I think, are just coming up. Oh, Jesus. Is it the white kind? or like It was... The, well, I don't know. I'm just... I'm obviously, I'm just popping it, it up a bit and then swallowing it right back down. Ah, uh, of course. <laughs> obviously. Point. I like... Willem Dafoe is funny when he's screaming and upset, but it's also he's also funny when he's just like, okay, Spider-Man. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to do that. You know, like what? Yeah. Just this weird kind of happy inflection with a gravelly menace. Uh, he was underneath good in it. Uh, John Carter. I saw that this weekend. He played oh, a yeah, uh, nine foot tall like four armed alien. What's his name? Like Non Duck Dar or something like that? As Kazar Kad- Kadash, cause something like that. Something <laughs> with a, there's a K in it somewhere. I think that's what uh, we ended up talking about Rutger Hauer because we were going to make our own Coney video and then it just turned into um, making it worse or whatever the show is going to be called. Yeah. The Rutten and Friends. Yeah, that's where that came from. Now we know. 
Uh, well, I guess it's almost questions. Is it questions time, Jim? I don't know what's going on. I'm all, I'm all confused oh, now. Yeah, I can answer some more fucking questions. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, rap, rap oh. style. <laughs> I like it when people tell you what their style is while they're doing the style. <laughs> you know? I got to rap to the beat. I know that you're rapping. You are rapping. I'm hearing you. I know, but I'll tell you. I think it's great. Anyway, yeah, let's do those questions. Hell yeah. Mr. Donut says, Jonathan Holmes, is it wrong that I want to be a baby again just because the thought of you cuddling and cradling me is a beautiful one? And then he guesses his real question is, will you and Jim finally get together and adopt me? Wow. That's awfully nice. <laughs> Is it wrong, was the question? Uh, the first part was, is it, is it wrong for him want to, to want to be a baby again so that you can cuddle and cradle him? No, no, that's very flattering. I, uh, I like to try to uh, um, nurture and support people, regardless of their age. So sure, if you'd be most comfortable being cuddled and cradled if you're a baby... Let's do it. Let's make you a baby. But, you know, if you want me to just, you know, give you a supportive pat on the back and say, hey, keep doing what you're doing, buddy. I can do that, too. Whatever whatever works for you, I'll do it. Yeah. No yeah. That reminds me. Uh, I don't want to say their name because in case this doesn't work out, I don't want them to get, like, hate mail and stuff. But someone who follows us on Twitter has offered to make a app about uh, me. And I want it to be good. Uh, their idea is that it's an app where you enter in what your problem is out of like a out of an algorithm of problems. You know, like work problem. Click on it. Boss is being a jerk. Coworkers don't like you. Don't get paid enough. That sort of thing. And then you pick one of the specific problems. And then my head suddenly pops up, and like a creepy Terry Gilliam animation gives you some supportive advice or affirmation. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, they want to make one about you too, Jim. So um, that's something to work on. They want to make but one I... about you too, like Bono's secret candy factory. <laughs> or something. No, no, they want to make one about you doing something along the they same. They could line. make one about me being the front man of you too. They could make that. That would be quite a change up for you two fans. I, there, there's a small, <laughs> small member, small uh, portion of the population that would be really excited about that. And then a lot of people that would be um, somewhat put off. Because you have some things in common with Bono. I'm an arrogant, that, egotistical oh. prick. <laughs> you wear sunglasses. I wear, he wear stupid sunglasses. sunglasses. I do look like both a fat Bono accents. on any given day of the week. <laughs> I think you have a lot of the same traits. But the the vocal inflection is, is not quite the same. I think that would let some of the fans no, down. How about Others this? May- how about this, right? Yeah, I'm ready. Sunday, bloody Sunday, the sweetest thing. How about that? Indistinguishable. They would be pretty upset. Here's another one, right? Especially if... Here's another one, right? please. Just in an interview, Mm -hmm. right? They'll be interviewing me. I'm here with Bono, and I'll be like, Thank you very much. Ta edge place to get here. Indistinguishable. Indistinguishable. Uh, it's like looking in a mirror, except you're Bono and you're looking at Bono. And yeah. you're not looking in a mirror. You're talking. Other than that, it's exactly like looking in a mirror. Yeah, it's beautiful. They'd be mad, those YouTube fans. I think we should... Uh, I'll, I'll work on that app, though, just in case. Assuming that's what you want your app to be. Tell me if you think of some other ideas. We'll try to make you an Yeah, app. I'll do whatever. I'm all Jim. good. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you're, you're almost always down. Yeah. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> Ace Flibble says, if you include specials, oh, yeah, lost episodes, and so on, this is this is technically the 200th episode of Podtoid. Apparently this is it if you count like lost stuff and specials. And he says, any celebration plans? To which I answer... Did you not just hear my picture-perfect Bono impersonation? I think that's celebration <laughs> enough, and I think that's a special enough occasion, Marka. Absolutely, yeah, we've done it. We have celebrated our ourselves as well as we ever could. We are even better for it as well. We're great, and we know it, and we showed it. 
So, yep, yeah, you're welcome. Fuck yeah. Uh, perf- <laughs> Perfidious Sin has a question for both of us, asking if our wives get jealous at the intense emotional relationship that we have together. You and I, Jonathan Holmes. Beautiful, intense relationship. Beautiful, man. Beautiful. It is beautiful. My, my wife doesn't know anything about it, really. <gasps> She's never listened to Podtoid. She... She knows I have one of your T-shirts, and like I keep it near my bed sometimes. And she's like, "What are you doing in that T-shirt?" But I've been meaning to mail it to you since last year, Jim. I apologize. <laughs> uh, she's like, "Oh yeah, the, you got that Jim T. Sterling T-shirt, huh?" I'm like, "Yeah, just not doing anything with it. I might put it on later, or just have it around." But other than that, she doesn't really know much about uh, about what goes on between us. Uh, which is cool. My wife yeah. um, actively encourages it. <laughs> She 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 finds it amusing. She likes she'll laugh because sometimes we'll be in bed together and I'll just say, oh, I can't stop thinking about Jonathan Holmes. <laughs> and then she, you know she might help me come up with ideas for things that I'm going to do. Well, that's touching. I'm glad that she's not uh, threatened or repulsed by me. We've never met in real life, but she said some very nice things to me on the internet, and uh, likewise, I'm, I'm sure I like her too. Yeah, she's alright. Yeah, I like her. Yeah. I like her. I, we get on. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Librarian Mike wants to know if there are reviewers from other websites that we admire. Uh, sometimes, yeah. Not, not. I don't really. This is gonna sound terrible, but I, I don't admire myself or anyone else who just does this stuff that I do, um, that we we do. And that's not because I don't think it's important or great. I just don't, I just not really like that. I'm trying to think of anyone I I make a big deal out of or someone that I think is, is terrible either. And I just don't kind of qualify people like that as like really great or really awful. Um, nope. Can't think of anyone that I think really sucks or is really awesome. I think you're good, Jim. I think Anthony Birch is a great writer of reviews uh i like a lot of our reviews writers uh totilio writes some good reviews sometimes that i used to say his name he writes some good ones uh i don't know they're they're fine uh yeah they're good how about you jim uh i got very well with ben cachero i think ben cachero uh, has yeah. his head screwed on straight uh he knows what he's doing uh i like edgy's reviews um, because they seem to be coming from the same place I come from. They seem to... My reviews often line up with theirs, and they seem like one of the yeah. few outlets out there that aren't afraid to, you know... Um, you know, we don't always agree, but they seem to not be as afraid of, of big AAA games as, as our other outlets seem to sometimes appear. Uh, so I like them a lot. I like all the guys there. Um, I think that's really it, sort of Edge and... And uh, Ben Cachera. Uh Justin McElroy, I like a lot. Um, I just think, you know, I think he's an awesome guy. Just uh, he's great yeah. to chat to. He's got a great sense of humor, and and his reviews are often very interesting to read. So yeah, they're they're the guys I would recommend outside of Destructoid. Sure, yeah, they're good. They're, but there are a lot of guys are good. There's a lot of good reviews out there. Uh, Depends on the review, and it depends on the game, and it depends on whether the reviewer was a right fit for the game, and it depends on if they try to really get to the bottom of, of what the game does in terms of effectiveness and why it does it. Sometimes a reviewer might do that with the game, and other times, if it's Mario Party 9, they'll just be like, oh yeah, it's just another Mario Party game. And they may be a perfectly good reviewer, but that particular review just isn't very insightful or... So many things that can go wrong. It's so hard to just categorize people as, you know, good or bad, what they're doing. That's what I think. It's <laughs> my new way of signaling to you that I'm, I'm done with a statement, <laughs> so you can talk now. <laughs> yeah. That's work. <laughs> it's pretty fun. <laughs> I do like the penguin a lot. Yeah. Uh, Nintendo yeah, Nick cool. wants to know. This is probably more a question for you than me because I certainly haven't. Uh, have you ever played Porky Pig's Haunted Holiday on the SNES? Uh, I have not played Porky Pig's Haunting Haunted Holiday on the SNES, and it's hard to imagine that it would be any good. 
because those licensed games were usually pretty bad, except for that one Tiny Toons game and the uh, Capcom Disney game. Those were pretty good. Other than that... Uh, the so Tiny well. Toon NES so game. How about you, Jim? You play it? Yeah, it's not too bad. I remember right. that one. That was cool. It was... Yeah, that was all right. Yeah. Yeah, I've certainly not played Haunted yeah, thing, but he said it was very weird, so... Uh-huh. Maybe it's something worth it. checking out, yeah. Yeah, every once in a while, um, they sneak in some ideas. Just as there's those really weird episodes of G.I. Joe that I talk about a lot, where um, Shipwreck is given three wishes from magical elves, and um, the Dreadnoughts start their own rock and roll band called Cold Slither and stuff like that. Back in those days, uh, Weirdo could slip in ideas for stuff that were for kids and make some fun stuff happen. So maybe that's how Porky Pig is, his new SNES game that I'll be checking out. Yeah. 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 Um, King Crude says that Heather in EastEnders is going to be killed off. I, I can't even remember who Heather is. Um, what? It, no, it's, Heather in EastEnders? It's British stuff. Oh, okay. Random mm. Bullseye in massive letters has written, talk about dinosaurs for a minute, impersonate Robin Williams in that movie, you know the one, with that little girl who I thought would grow up hot but didn't, you know. And then he, I don't know, he posted a picture of that woman. I don't know who she is. Um, Is that you know what or not that I think of movies I liked when I was a kid and wonder, is that chick hot now? Then I look them up and find out things like what happened to her and suddenly my heart gets broken. Not to go all random horror on you buttholes, but Holmes has to know what happened to that poor little girl. Also, besides just also Cox, I watched a documentary called Chasing Ghosts about all the champion. I watched that the other day. I watched that last night. Um, I meant to watch. I still haven't seen it. Yeah. Is it good? It was, it was quite oh, cool. It was good. quite funny. Um, I watched a documentary called okay. Chasing Ghosts about all the champion video game players from the old arcades. Fuck, fuck you, random balls. Huh? <laughs> it was also like all the great scenes of winners at games, losers at life from King of Kong, but amplified to scary proportions. As usual with documentaries, I looked up what happened to these guys after the movie, and as expected, it was not exactly pretty. There are a couple dudes in this movie who you simply must try to get interviews with for Podtoid, simply for the laughs. I had suspicions about one of them being a molester sure enough he was as homework for everybody this week go watch that movie and try to pick out the pervert chasing ghosts on netflix instant watch i know everyone will watch it just for that alone here it is on hulu i've been meaning to see it for years i get uh i get dogged by my arcade cabinet collecting friends for still having not watched it like I'm not legit, like I don't truly love arcade cabinets because I haven't seen it, and I've only seen King of Kong, or you know, Sellout, it's mainstream, you gotta see Chasing Ghosts, so yeah, I'll watch Chasing Ghosts and see yeah. who That's who weird, because I, is, but, yeah, I randomly yeah. was watching it last night, we just stumbled upon it and found out, obviously, Billy Mitchell and what the day were in it, and they're always good for a laugh, mm-hmm. so... Yeah. Sure, uh, for sure. I've, I've heard it's good. Just never got to it. Yeah. All right, I'll watch that tonight. Fine. He wins. Um, Roy I don't Schultz believe everything that. that I read, though. <laughs> who, 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 Moist Schultz? Roy Schultz, who? who calls himself... Um, oh, Mr. Awesome. Mr. Awesome, yeah. I fucking love that guy. I want to get him on Podtoid. <laughs> that shouldn't be too hard. He's just got a yeah. job somewhere and hanging out. Yeah, well, I'll track him down. Um... I was going to say that you can't believe everything you read on the internet about people being molesters and whatnot, though. You really got to check with the uh, local registry. Look up in the, uh, as you know, the sex offenders board. I've looked up many people on there to see if their level of sex offense is, in fact, what they claim that it is. And uh, they're pretty accurate on that website. It's the only place you can really go to to really see who your local pedophiles are. Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one more, I think. Sure. And that would be... Joe Pan says... I'm going to change his question just a little bit. Um, he wants to know what the unintentionally sarcastic old man might say about mm. Mass Effect 3's ending. Oh, boy. And he said just say it about the ending being awesome, but I want him, I want him to address the fans' concerns about Mass Effect 3's ending. Okay, okay. <sighs> End scene. Oh, so you guys bought a video game 
and you played it to the end, and then something happened for a few minutes <laughs> that you didn't like that much. That sounds really hard for you to cope with. <laughs> I hope that uh, they make it up to you by giving you a new game for free with all this stuff in it, with the magical fantasies that you enjoy. They owe you... They, yeah, they owe you so much for all the suffering. <laughs> I hurt my stomach. <laughs> One sec. Ah, oh, it's cramping up really bad. Ah, oh, for some reason, my my middle to the left stomach muscle is <laughs> is, is spasming. Oh, uh, that that's uh, that's good enough. I think that was it. I probably went on for a little. Too that long. did yeah. well. Oh, okay. always good for a visit from the unintentionally sarcastic old man. Yeah, yeah. He didn't. Uh, I'm still working on it. He didn't sound as uh, sarcastic as I would have wanted. There, there was one point he did. He I'll, sounded I'll like it. an old man, though. All right. Yep. So I'm halfway there. Thanks, Jim. Oh, living on a prayer. See, my Bono impersonation is perfect. <laughs> he sounded. He sounded exactly like him. You did. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for spending all your time with us on Bad Side. I've been your host, Jim Sterling, which I probably should have said at the beginning. Um, oh. I don't think I introduced us. Doesn't matter. They they know who we are. Um, and I'm joined, of course, by Jonathan Holmes, who was also talking for I the did. bits when I, I talk- weren't talking. Yikes, I talked a lot in this episode. Sorry about that, guys. Hey. Yeah. It's, it's, mm. If it's not you, it's me. So. Yeah, so either pick, way. Pick your favorite and be happy either way. Oh, yeah, that's a good attitude. Absolutely. Good positive attitude to have in the world. Um, yeah, and don't complain about Mass Effect 3's ending, because the endings of every pod toy for the past, like, <laughs> since we rebooted, have been worse. <laughs> because it gets awkward and I forget the things I meant to say. Uh, Jonathan Holmes, you got anything in the pipeline that we should all be reading, watching, looking at, listening to? Uh, well, I'm hoping to get this Metal Gear solid Snake Eater 3D review done. Uh, for Thursday at the very latest, and then I'm also working on reviewing Mario Party 9 and uh, Mortal Kombat Collection, which is basically I just... I kissed Mortal those two games. <laughs> Did uh, you? Before <laughs> I mailed them to you, I gave them, like, really passionate kisses. <laughs> I just got them, and I'm uh, starting in on them while I'm finishing writing. Did they, did they smell of my stinky kisses? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't smell them that hard, but I still have the... Uh, shrink wrap so I'll, I'll give that a whiff and and let you know so yeah i'm working on that and we've got a special guest on uh my weird show sup holmes uh, a guy named philip tibitoski who's working on octodad you know octodad jim i have certainly heard of it that is one funny game uh it, it, if you've ever felt like you had to fake it to make it and pretend that you were something you weren't, either on a date or at a job or any time in life, when it's just painfully obvious that you are not qualified or not ready to do something, but you just pretend that you are, you probably know that feeling, right, Jim? Like dating a beautiful woman and she's like, oh, wow, uh, you, you, you're such a good match for me. And you're thinking to yourself, I'm not good enough for this woman, but I'm going to pretend I'm confident and that I'm great. And she's going to love me. Every, you know that every beautiful woman I've dated, I've been like that. Likewise, that's exactly how I feel. Octodad is the perfect uh, and a video game-based analogy for that feeling. It's about an octopus who has a wife and, I think, two children, and he's got to put on a suit and, like, carry out the functions of a normally uh, boned, you know, the, the, a man with a normal human anatomy, even though he doesn't have one. So he's constantly sliding around and you know, spilling the coffee and totally screwing up his life. And they're like, what's wrong with you, Dad? You seem a little off today. It's because <laughs> it's an octopus. It's an octopus in a suit. Uh, he helped make that game. It's free right now. You can download it. I think at like octodad.com. And the sequel, Octodad 2, Dadliest Catch, is coming out in 2013. And that won't be free because it's a much bigger game. So we'll be talking about that on Sub Holmes, which is a show that I do on Twitch dot tv slash destructoid it also pops up on destructoid.com every sunday at 1 p.m pacific standard time 4 p.m eastern standard time 
And then we put it into a podcast, which you can download on uh, Libsyn.com. Just look up Libsyn uh, and Sup Holmes in Google, and it'll pop up for you. And we put clips on YouTube and stuff like that. I'm trying to trying to keep the show going. So far, so good. We had Luke Bernard on last Sunday, and that was a treat. Luke says hi, Jim. He's oh, knows. brilliant. Yeah. yeah, he's a funny guy. We had a good time. You can download his uh, episode of Sup Holmes, I think, as of now, if not tomorrow, uh, on the Libsyn website. Awesome. Yeah, I'm trying to do stuff. I got to keep busy. Otherwise, yeah. you know, the memories of what happened come back, at least in my case. Um, <laughs> a review of Silent Hill Downpour is available on Destructor.com, which I wrote. You can read that if you want. We've got reviews coming up for other Silent Hill games this month and uh, Operation Raccoon City, if they send it. And you can go on escapistmagazine.com and look at the Jimquisition, which I do every Monday. This week was about art games and um, carried on a lot of stuff we said last week about Dear Esther and that sort of thing. So that's good to listen to. Uh, otherwise, you can catch us a lot of the time on destructo.com and around the web um, if you want. I don't know. And yeah, yeah. Know. review us on iTunes, please, because that always helps. Um, good reviews, not bad ones. That wouldn't help. Why would that help you, idiot? You can get our Android app off the Amazon app marketplace for $2, and then you get episodes on your phone. Um, so that might be good if you want. <sighs> You've done it. Good ending. Oh, yeah. Hey, Bye. When... No, no, no. Not yet. When, no. I, when I do, oh. well, I guess we could end well, the show. Uh, it's not really. It's not worth putting on the show, but I'm just... You've I'm thrown just... everything into chaos. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I do little burps, do, do you hear it? Uh, I don't know. I hope not. Do you ever hear, like, little... I've like... never heard little burps. All right, because I do them sometimes. I like... try to hold them in, like, the, the middle of my throat, and so they don't come out of my nose or mouth and stuff like that, so you don't hear them. Yeah. Oh, one last thing. The, uh... The new Adventure Time DVD is out. You should go buy it. It's really good. Okay. Yeah, okay, that's it. Thanks, Jim. Bye.